Fanboy Crossing presents the Word with a Nerd Podcast. An interesting conversation about interesting topics with interesting people. With your host, Sam Haynes. Greetings and salutations, this is the Word with a Nerd Podcast. I'm your nerd, Simon Haynes, and with me today is my friend Tammy Wesselman. Hello! How are you today? I'm oh, really good. It's a beautiful day. Yeah, it's fantastic. I wish the planes would go away. <laughs> we were going to talk about... Nerd cultures and fake geeks. Ah, the fake the geek, geek girl, girl thing. Um, I don't even think it's a thing, but I'd like to know what you know about it. I was just going to talk about this to you. I some place that this morning there was a port of a costumer over in I think it was New York Comic Con. Yeah, this you post. Weekend. Yeah, the one you post. I don't know what outfit she was wearing, but she's one of those quite well known mm-hmm. costumers. And yeah, she got harassed by these news reporters. <laughs> That's far more insidious than you know wearing a Batman T-shirt if you don't really like Batman. <laughs> Dressing up as a reporter. No, but there's there's been this rash of like guys who go to conventions, you know, and all they're doing is taking crotch and arse shots mm. and boob shots and asking the female cosplayers some of the most the most insulting questions you can think of. It's just so yeah, take it as an example. The first and pretty much only question is, does that costume get you laid? Wow, that's really rude. That's really, really mean. Who says that to another person no, really? Yeah. And here I was thinking, oh, surely these people only say that kind of thing online. No, that's... The pr- <laughs> if only it was online. Yeah. You know, if only they were kept to YouTube. You can be a little bit forgiving <laughs> in oh. that instance. Not too much, because you know, some things do get really mean, but you know. I mean, if it was mean things, I think mm. it'd be water for ducks back. People, customers mm. especially, you get mean comments, but mm. when it's something that quite overt... Yeah. That thing of like, <laughs> but that costume gets you like that's just not a nice thing to say to yeah. anyone. And it's um, I mean, I I dress up in a bloody red mm. underwear and a pot on my head. If someone says that to me, I'll probably laugh my ass off. Yeah, that. but um, often women do get their sexuality put into the situation or mentioned, brought up completely inappropriately. You can be going about your day and bam, your sexuality's questioned, your breasts are mentioned, <laughs> your body's talked about. I think it's that problem where because of like fandom and culture, like Comic Cons and stuff like that, it's supposed to be a place to get away from all that. Mm. And it's creeping slowly creeping into that. I think that's that's what disturbs me. It's mm. like this once safe haven where people who let's face it, nerds are the ostracized, the isolated, mm. to have that space kind of lack of a better term, desecrated by tourists. utter creeps. And tourists and even tourists are fine if they just stick to politely <laughs> taking pictures and yeah. looking around wide eyed. <laughs> You get, well, the normal people. No, you get people mm. who come to these things and just want to check it out. Mm. And, or, for example, like, you know, a big con, like Oz Comic Con, where, you know, mm. someone who's not necessarily nerd, but they love mm. Richard Dean Anderson. Yeah, you don't know what someone's into. So yeah. Obviously, there's something bringing them there. Yeah, so people who never go to a convention mm. in their life, but they're, or there's, some, there's this mm. TV idol they want to go and have a photo with. Mm. You don't want to stop that. No, of course not, no. But you can't say you can't come unless you're, you know, a certain list of things. Every few months, there's always someone's like, how geeky are you? They have mm. this list. Technically, no one could complete that list. No mm. one could get 100%. No. It's always that thing of like, have you watched every single episode? of Star Trek have you watched every single episode of Game of Thrones have you watched every single episode (laughs) if you watched every single episode on every single Mm. thing they've list you would have to have watched it since you were born until you die and have nothing in between so you'd probably have had a very adventurous life (laughs) in the realms of fiction but you have probably never gone outside I think there is a little bit of competitivism though in like um, reading the book first how much you know about something and sometimes that's a really friendly competitivism it, um, and having, um, you know, all sorts of fun debates. <laughs> I think knowledge is a great thing. That's mm. the thing, you know, you're saying about reading the book first. So that goes to a dialogue. Mm. You can say, you know, someone says, like you were, we were talking before we recorded about, mm. um, you were going to see that play and they had someone had done the spiel <laughs> yes. about Game of Thrones. <laughs> Yelled yo- it out in the theatre. Yeah, Yelled it out in the theatre. And of course, all the people who watched the TV episodes mm. were going, no! But of course, mm. any, everyone in the books were just going, <laughs> they're probably snickering because they're just going, I know something you don't. But Oh, the girl next to me who'd read it in the book was devastated that he'd do that to people. <laughs> but I suppose that's also a context because mm. you were saying it was like a Hunger Games cross <laughs> The um the panto was Hunger Games and Willy Wonka cross called the Wonka Games. <laughs> it was really good. I, I haven't read the Hunger Games. I've not watched the movie anyway. Um, but you, you kind of get this whole idea that you know, like when 
Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, oh, Charlie and Chocolate Factory, but then mm. the movie for extension, how all those kids kind of get uh, taken out. I'm guessing it's something like yes, that. Yes, like, yes, you know, it's, be... it's putting those things together. Oh, yeah. my God. That's very be, clever. That very would be awesome. And, of course, very overt. It was a panto, so... Oh, yeah. <laughs> very silly and overt. So how many, how many people were going, it's behind <laughs> Little bit, yo. <laughs> I know it's tangent, but because I, I grew up with panto in, in mm. England, but there's no panto culture over here. So, mm. although then again, you you probably would disagree with the whole theatre culture mm. over here is very very limited compared to other places. Oh, um, luckily I. But been, you watch a lot more. Haven't theater. been to any of those other places, so, and no. my budget stretched to the limit seeing theatre in you Perth. Watch, you watch a lot more theatre. than Yeah, I, do. I try let's, and go to theatre really even, regularly. Let's not even go there because I haven't seen. I haven't been to a show since so, uh, Wicked. But then again, I went to that. <laughs> uh, there was a show my friend uh, had the other week. Uh, literally, the one weekend I could go, they sold out all the tickets. I was like, ah! No, I love to go see shows. I'm so busy nowadays that trying to mm. watch a show is just nigh on impossible. I also like seeing stuff from, I saw something at Sterling Players called A Country Retreat. Yeah. which was um, an Australian written play. It was an Australian theme. Mm-hmm. Nothing I'd normally really <laughs> like. I don't want to say it was boring. Yeah. But you really, really she went and watched it. But it was really it was really cool to see, and I like seeing stuff from the cheaper, more accessible local theatre group, all yeah. amateurs, to something like Wicked on at yeah. the or at Crown Theatre. But I bet you there would be someone out there saying, oh, you didn't watch it on Broadway, therefore you're fake. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> You didn't. You didn't watch it at its peak on Broadway. Yeah, because mm. I don't live in freaking New York. <laughs> yeah, as actually, no matter what you do, I think there's people that are going to call you fake or people who try to be elitist. I found that in the music scenes, for sure, being into the band first, I liked them before they were cool. And by the way, yeah, I was a hipster when they were called indies. <laughs> <laughs> I, so yeah, I was. I was walking through Perth uh, yesterday, it was the Perth Zombie Walk, mm. uh, dressed up as a Ghostbuster, and came out to this group, and it just looked like, oh my god, the, the hipsters have hatched. Because they, <laughs> they looked about 16, mm. but they all had that thing where they all had, they all looked, there were three different guys, you just tell just from mm. the, you know, their face and that, but they had essentially all the same body shape, that mm. kind of awkward body posure, mm. the short sleeve um, checkied shirts. I'm not. I don't really need them, but I'm wearing not d- nerdy kind of glasses, like the Oakleys with the lenses popped out kind of thing. Wow, people actually wear them. And um, like you know, the tight jeans all the way up. You know, the, I think it's just fashion. And, I think kids look lovely. And, and like the shaved head. I, I think I'm chasing the wrong zombies. <laughs> Oh, I think they look oh, cute. It's, it's, I, I've never followed fashion. Mm. I say here, I'm sitting in a pair of tracky dacks. I'm a dack, so I'm, mm. I, I'm, I'm fully aware of my own things. And on occasionally on weekends, I dress up in a costume. <laughs> I will never hold anyone to accountability for my own <laughs> for fashion. I used to care a lot more about fashion and dressing up in my 20s when I went clubbing and stuff. But, but that brings us back on topic. You, the whole idea that where if you, you wear in a geek shirt, mm. but you know, and it's directed more at uh, the female populace. It's like, oh, you don't know what you you wear in a geek shirt. You don't know what you're doing. How the hell do you know just from looking at someone if they know um, about? Okay, for example, someone wearing a mm. Batman or Superman T-shirt. Odds are they know who Batman and Superman yeah, are. Yeah, they're fairly well known. If they were in a Green Lantern t-shirt, probably a bit more mm. obscure. Even uh, then, they've just had a big movie, so... A lot of these shirts are quite fashionable at the moment. Yeah, and like, because, was it, uh, what story is it? JJ's? I, I don't know, mm, I don't shop in those places. They have, like, the retro vintage mm. worn shirts, and I must admit, I would want to wear them, they're just mm-hmm. not in my size, they don't make them for actual mm. fanboys. Mm. The term that I loathe, which I've heard just recently, is a uh, neck bearded basement dweller. I'm sorry, all yeah. people wearing neck bearded basement dweller. It's like, yeah, oh, well. um, that really doesn't fit with my concept of geeky guys. But if you look at any kind of geeky guys in general, the, the stereotype is pasty skinned, mm. overweight, and all that, but or unhealthily thin. Yeah, but you look at the thing, it's like, no, most of them are just as average as everyone else. Mm. They just have a different, you know, they do do different things, yeah. you know. That's one thing, I, that's what bothers me. The inclusiveness of fandom is starting to be taken over by this you know, no we got we only accept if you're at this level mm. Piss off. but yeah as i said that sort of elitism kind of happens within a lot of a lot of groups and as i was saying before we were recording it depends on where those fan groups exist mm. and how you come across and how you meet people whether that be online or at conventions which um they seem to be a very constructed reality mm. because of how special and rare they are especially if you live in perth oh yeah to maybe um, 
theatre film or nightclub sort of scenes where geekiness will prevail. Maybe that's but, just the theatres, films and nightclubs I've been to. Well, no, but you think of um, how much the internet has helped broaden those communities. Mm. I mean, I, I think about my lonely years at high school where, you know, there were nerds there, but mm. they were like, you know, I don't want to say not the people I want to hang out with them because I did. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like my high school years. No, but it was that thing where there wasn't any comic book geeks. Mm. There were there were the nerds, but they were like you know the like your atypical mm. nerd, if you, for lack of a better term. You know, they're always like it sounds really denigrating when I think about it, but it's not that thing of like I'm trying to put them down. It's like, like they were all like computer programmers. Mm. They're all highly intellectual. And that if, was the smart kids. They were the smart kids, but they also, to a certain degree, they kind of looked down upon you if you weren't at their level. Mm. So I never felt kind of truly comfortable with a lot of the um, those guy and guys there. I'm not saying I'm dumb but it's one of those things where I didn't it always felt that thing of like they knew something I didn't and therefore they had a superiority to mm. them but outside of that I didn't know many comic book readers mm. and I love comics and stuff like that and there was no one who you know there's that thing of either it was a too juvenile or nobody bothered with them mm. so I had I didn't have that connection with a lot of friends I got that connection later yeah you d- yeah when you get older and you and also my social circle would be literally the high school mm. so anyone within bike riding distance you could say was your social circle now I have friends who live well I have a friend who lives 45 minutes north of me mm-hmm. and I also have a friend who lives 45 minutes south of me and one time I had to drive from one friend to another mm. so yeah about 90 minutes <laughs> well different <laughs> different things um, it, hold together expanded. your social groups yeah. depending on like how, how you meet these people or yeah. whether I mean I have kept a few friends from school most of the friends I have now I've had for many many years I sadly have not kept any of my friends from high school it's not out of like bitterness or anything like that it's just that's what happened the only person I know who actually went to my high school I actually met after I went to yeah. high school it just happens you know that was also because uh, that's my friend Ev mm. and he's a year older than me so you know, in high school that was like well, division by age mm. oh he's yeah, a year older you don't, you don't have anything to do with that mm. you don't have anything to do with a person that's a year older than you perish the thought actually when I, I changed high schools in year 11 and 12 and I hung out with the year group below me but I was new to the school and no one knew me and I was hanging out with this different group <laughs> that I knew from the neighbourhood, so they yeah. let me slip under the radar, which was good. But no real geeks in that group, but... Although I suppose if you're growing up with, like, a certain people in your class and then that kind of travels on, mm. so you know people in a group, in a class, mm. that, that friendship will develop in a class, and then when you go to next year, even if you might be split mm. off, you might still have that friendship, mm. you might not occasionally, and to the point where, yeah, as, it, as you're all living in the same area, you're still mm. essentially in that same circle, so you probably have a different experience with me, because, well, I have I have roughly the same experience because I came over in 80, mm. 87 and 88, and then I transferred between two primary schools in 88 so between 88 to when I graduated high school I had pretty much this it was that same group of people that mm. I knew I've never had a group of friends I have a lot of I've gone through I, having no friends I, I one say, close <clears throat> one or two very very close friends I oh, don't get me wrong I don't say they're friends I say they're a group of people I know <laughs> <laughs> you know the fact that you've got these for purposes about you in primary school you've essentially got one year they're the same year that extends mm. out for several years and then in high school you break branch off but you still essentially know all those people more or less it might diminish over time as they move away but you'll still know that group of people not necessarily your friends but you'll know them no i didn't mostly know people's names yeah. in school i was really picked on and oh, mostly i didn't even it's funny because of that kind of fame people always knew my name and I didn't I didn't know any of theirs I Maybe people. that's why they didn't like me because I didn't know their name <laughs> No, probably more to it no, than that. No, I got picked on as well, so mm. nerd. What really I saved to get what, picked on? Yeah, what really saved me is the stuff I got into with, say, bands or clubs mm. or film, which I got into as I've gotten older. Um, the film festival I was doing stuff on my own mm. and finding these interests and finding these passions, and either having one good friend to do stuff with, or just saying, "Well, if I don't go by myself, I'm not going." And that's a great way to go out and enjoy culture because that's um we're talking about geekiness and where this stuff's like for me with film you can call me a fake geek girl now because i'd rather go to a film festival to see a film than watch it on my at home because it's an outing it's fun you get to be somewhere and there are cool people there but no i don't just say that doesn't make you a fake geek girl because you're actually going and doing it you're not taking a photo of you on, on, on instagram and thinking hey look i'm fake but no you go back to the going back to that fake geek girl thing is that let's face it a lot of that fake geek girl stuff is Actually, it's thrown towards all mm. female geeks. It's the pretty at, ones. At pretty much all the time. My main influence of geek culture is having a geeky brother. Yeah, I never really got to know him. No, you that, didn't. But... And um, he passed away from a brain tumour. And yeah. uh, he um, he was like, really, like, overweight, 
socially inept, well, complete can, Star Trek totally, fan. I can totally <laughs> ever like. Worked in IT, <laughs> the whole bit. And, you know, I remember watching Star Wars when I was little and watching Star Trek. I, I didn't like how the, the women in Star Trek were filmed in soft focus, <laughs> but I, I didn't have those words. So I'd, I'd be like, why are the girls fuzzy? <laughs> Well, the simplest way to say it is uh, Gene Roddenberry was a sexist pig. No, I'm kidding. No, Gene Roddenberry's got a he, vision he, for the future. No, his vision for the future meant lovely girls. We mm. all know that. He had, a, he had a soft spot for ladies. And if we're going to be talking about sexism, I mean, a beautiful woman in itself, that's showing of a beautiful woman, that's not sexist. Yeah. In the same way of showing as a very beautiful man isn't. Yeah. Isn't sexist. I was going to say, you look at you look at Star Trek. It's not like all the um, it's not like all those the cast the male cast members were heifers like mm. they eventually became. But um, you know, Captain Kirk was was always done up handsome. Mm. Spock became a sex symbol. Mm. So I think again, there was that problem where the f- sexism thing always does get. Yeah, you were saying before how it always gets landed on the females mm. a lot of the time, and that's again, I think that's the same problem with fake geek girls. And I've stated this before. I think they're the percentage of fake geek girls and fake geek guys are exactly the same. Mm. What would you call a fake geek guy, though? But that's that's the problem. The definition is mm. that the, the the label is always tagged to people who are like you know, oh, there's a girl wearing a geeky t-shirt. She must be fake. Mm. But guys wear geeky t-shirts too. The assumption is half the time is that the guy knows what he's what he's wearing, and then the, but that is a problem because the assumption then goes. But that means the girl is obviously not. It's like well, mm. she just woke up one morning and went. I'm just going to throw on this random t-shirt. I don't know what it says. Spy. Yeah, because that's how we get man. dressed. Oh, Randomly, well, yeah. and not thinking what other people are going to think of us. That's exactly how women live. So, <laughs> you know, the whole you go into all set, set, you know, we're saying before about fashion, you go into all those stereotypes where it's like, oh, women always think about what they want to wear because they want to look attractive, want to look mm. good. So if they want to look attractive, want to look good, why the fuck are they wearing a Batman t-shirt? <laughs> There's, it's logically a fallacy. No matter how you kind of swipe it, we we did chat online once. Mm. You you took the devil's avocado position, and I was, I was getting a little bit wild up. then, because again, I'm oh, researching my, a lot of this. My point was that I heard fake geek girls described as being what I consider really sexist language, um, attention whores, which I have so many problems with. <laughs> yeah. It pathologizes attention, which is um, a basic human need, mm. and puts down prostitutes. Well. So, and and the fact that these girls are doing it purely for sexual attention, purely for attention from men, that's the definition I heard. Yeah. My devil's advocate argument was to, of course, think of it within the context where we live, where women, whether it be consciously or subconsciously, are trained to think about what you look like, how you appear to the opposite sex all the time. And to then say, what, no girl's going to go into Comic-Con showing off her tits because that's fun? But you also, that's the thing. Why, why does it have to be a specific case for fan culture, why does it need a special... So, you know, an attention whore is an attention whore is an attention whore. Why does it have but to I, say... I, that's why I don't believe in the term attention whore. Yeah, true. <laughs> that's no. what I'm saying. I think people are attention seekers. I'm not sure you know, how much of it. Why pathologise that, though? That's true. That's my point. <laughs> but that's why I label them a fake. They could know everything they know about the fandom mm-hmm. you consider to be an expert on. And they could probably even know more. Why call them a fake? Because you don't know. I think it's just sexism, or, or, honestly. Yeah. It's a way of exclusion. It's, and that's, and that's what I'm fighting against. Mm, but I think, yeah, if you're going too far, I thought you're going I, a little bit far and kind of ignoring the fact that maybe that is part of it. And, you know, again, it's about being shunned for showing sexuality. Yeah. You're told you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't when it comes I, to showing your sexuality. I'd rather err on the side of inclusion rather than exclusion. That's I've fair. said this a few times. I'd rather I'd rather call them a geek first. I mean, someone I think is going to say, if there's an attention whore, she's obviously a geek. I'm saying, though, if they're wearing mm. if they're wearing the Batman t-shirt and taking pictures on Instagram, they might be a geek. Mm. To label them immediately whore or no, fake mm. because just because of a photo is mm. absurd. And I'd rather say no. And here's the thing: this is the other the other argument I've heard is. Oh, they're just trying to sucker in the nerds because they want to seduce them all this other bullshit. Mm. It's like if they have, isn't invest- that good? <laughs> I'll get to that. <laughs> I've, actually, I'll talk about that. I've always wanted to write the most chauvin, not necessarily my pure point of view, but I wanted to write the most pure male chauvinistic piece of writing about you know about girls and fandom, and have all the feminists agree with me, and it's all about you know saying we should not get rid of them why because it's good to look at them exactly i want to do all that type of stuff and i, and I want i want uh, i want every feminist to be 100 percent behind mm-hmm. me no, it's going to be you're never going to get that no, no but you know the whole the whole idea is i want to be as crude and sexist mm-hmm. and 
to paraphrase, to quote a pendulette, nudity is its own reward. You know, <laughs> new people are its own reward. No idea is like, why are we shunning sexy cosplayers? Yeah. Because then what happens? We don't get any sexy cosplayers. Isn't that like the most stupidest thing possible? That's cutting off your nose mm. to spite your face yes. mentality. That's not entirely mm. my. No. That's not entirely my thoughts. I just wanted to do that as an exercise, yeah. and it, it's it's kind of true. Yeah, I like seeing sexy cosplayers. Of Why would I shun them? But anyway, the, the point is that usually, with going back to the cosplayers, this is where a lot of this fake gank geek mm. stuff is truly hits home. Not necessarily like the attention whores that post on bloody Instagram mm. and all this stuff. I hold the Nintendo controller. I must be a geek. T e e. That stuff is debatable. Mm. It's the people who go to cons. Whole another culture about girls posting pictures of themselves online. And... But that's just like saying there's a guy who wear band t-shirts mm. and like, again, it's that problem that it's an unfair, I'm trying to think of the word, you probably can point there. It's False dichotomy? Yeah, false dichotomy, <laughs> that's, that's the word. It's the fact that, that. it's the fact of, you know, it's perfectly fine for these people to do mm. it and it's perfect, it's a double standard. Yeah, double standard, yeah. That's the better one, double standards. These people can do it, these people can't. Mm. So that's it. But when it comes to cosplayers or con mm. community, okay, yes. I'll, I'll even say it flat out. There's probably girls at a convention that are just hanging out with their boyfriends. Mm. That being said, there's probably guys at a convention who are just hanging out with their girlfriends. Mm-hmm. They have n- no real interest. Mm. So what's what's the difference? There really is none. But that's that's also a separate issue to, yeah. to again. It always gets leveled at people who are geeks, like the cosplayers. It's like, oh, you're doing it just to attention mm. whore. Or you're selling something. It's like, as a costumer, it is not... A profitable business. Yeah, model. that's. <laughs> you're I, not making any money though. I'm not spending half as much time and money mm. as some of these professionals. I'm not even spending mm. a tenth of some of these professionals. I've even been asked to do commissions, and half the time I say, "Look, I don't really have the skills necessary to do this because mm. I don't want to take your money and then not be yeah. able to deliver." I've got two costumes mm. to build in under a month, and I'm on the dole. That's a lot of work <sighs> and money. I've got a lot of resources. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of materials mm. all up, but I still have to time and energy and stuff like that. October sucks. <laughs> it sucks because it's awesome because we've got doing so much. Mm. But there are a few people who make money off it, but they're not exactly mega rich. Mm. And usually the people who make the money off these things are tirelessly devoted to what they're doing to the point where they're doing all the research. They're making the costumes mm. supremely accurate. They are not just going, I'm just throwing mm. on a bloody um, a store-bought Batgirl costume and walk around convention mm. with my tits out and I'm getting all the money off the boys. It does not matter. But where, where are you getting money in this scenario? People do that. It's like, oh, they're just, they're doing it for the money. They're doing it for attention. But, but where is the money coming in? That's exactly. Are people giving you money? Are they tipping no, you? Uh, no, uh, uh, you can't. You are legally not, actually, you're legally not allowed to make any money off costume. Mm. Uh, that makes sense, actually. Um, what people do, though, outside of that, they'll sell prints mm-hmm. of their costumes. Or oh. they might sell their costumes later. Mm-hmm. That sounds like more of a way to make the money back. Yeah. You, you spend a lot of money trying mm. to do these things. There are some professional cosplayers mm. now. Let's, let's face it. But that's like that's like the 1%. Mm. It's not even 1% of the costumers. Because there's... I'm trying to think of her name. Yaya Han. She's like probably the most recognized cosplayer at the moment. And she just had a TV show. That's debatable on the um, how good that one is. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's a bit mm. iffy with that. She's tours internationally, and all she really sells, she has her own costume bits. She'll make things and sell mm. them online. But she probably makes most of her money from cost, costume appearances mm. and selling prints. Mm. Like, I think I ended up buying, was it, three prints of her last year at, um, again, for 25 bucks. And they were signed. Mm. Like, it was, this is cool. Yeah. So. I think, um. It's, it's not exactly, you know, Bill Gates money. I think the accusation that's always leveled at you know, really attractive women is that they're doing it to attention hall. Yeah. And th- that's where I said the middle ground is really tricky because to say that a woman is expressing her sexuality purely for the benefit of men, that's really sexist. Well, to if- say that we live in a... To ignore the fact we live in a world where women are under pressure to look and act a certain way and if it was one force just beating down yeah. on you saying sexism, sexism... It, it, that would be really quite easy to fight, but these forces, these influences, these systems are really sometimes they're implicit, sometimes they're explicit. But to deny they're there, it's getting to the point now there, there that it's becoming the detractors are getting more of a voice. It's the YouTube mm. commentator generation where people say the most vilest, foulest things mm. with no sense of, I'd say, propriety. It's the anon generation. 
there was a peach. There was this girl. Um, I can't remember what she, she had. Actually, a, um, I think it was an ovarian condition. So she was actually quite chubby. Mm. She, Whether that or she eats too much is no one's business. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's beside. No, she apparently actually. Um, mm. Either way, she has a medical condition. She once dressed up. I think it was last Halloween mm-hmm. last year. She dressed up for a party as Lara Croft. Mm-hmm. You know, traditionally sexy, sleeping, mm-hmm. blah, 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 blah. Beside the point. Someone took a photo of her. You know, she put it on her Facebook, and then about a few months ago, so it's like months, like mm. months and months and months after the actual event, someone had found the photo, must have, like, you know, just as it does with the internet, just yep. gets spread along, and it ended up on one of those, you know, uh, costuming file sites, mm-hmm. and it was on a Facebook thing, and it just got all these, like, oh, girl, should be wearing mm. that, oh, fat bitch, and blah, blah, blah. No, she was disgusting, she was a bit horrified at what happened. I think she ended up asking the person to take the photo mm. off, but what she ended up doing, this is actually even cooler. What did she do? She actually privately messaged every single person that commentated on that photo saying, you do realise, you know, this is a person you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I am I am the person on this phone. Would you even say that to me? If you... And for most of the time, people were just like, oh, I didn't know this was going out in public. Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know people would read this. Mm. Then why the hell did you fucking say it in the mm. first place? You know, it's the it's that whole keyboard hero yep, mentality. Yeah, absolutely. You know? That was that was that was actually pretty cool. Um, I'm kind of glad I'm an adult <laughs> when I've um, embraced the internet because, especially as a younger girl, um, you know, suffering from low self esteem, seeing constant pictures candidly taken, especially of overweight people, whether yeah. they're cosplaying or not, for the purpose of ridicule. You know, it's it's horrifying the amount of. Um, stories you see about people who have committed suicide mm. over the most trivial bullshit on the internet because they can't live it down. And, and that is horrifying. And then it's, you know, not trivial then, you know. Well, no, as in like, it's, you know, yeah. some someone has a spat at a, at a school and mm. that gets carried over yeah. if it's between two mm. people, but then other people chime in and bully this other mm. person. I'm going to switch slightly tangent. There was an infamous case. There's these two girls in, I think, high school mm. just a few years ago. The, and they had a spat. Mm-hmm. And wow, two girls in high school had a spat? I know, who, who would believe it? But the mother of the one girl mm. created a phony Facebook profile. A mother? A the grown mother up of one here. A grown up, <laughs> uh, you know, a presumably grown up mm. person. Grown up possibly only by age. Mm-hmm. Because what you're going to hear is quite uh, horrific. She made a fake profile. She befriended her daughter's former friend. Yeah. Got her to basically got really close to her. Starts, you know, getting her to open up, tell all the secrets. And then I'm not entirely sure what she did because and my brain doesn't mm. want to recall because it's quite horrifying. It but sounds, she she did basically, you know It sounds like what they call she, grooming. She basically groomed her. She like I think started blackmailing her and all this other stuff like oh, I'm gonna tell you mm-hmm. all these dirty different secrets about you. Rah, 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 rah. Wow. And uh, yeah, um, you can probably figure mm-hmm. out the horrifying conclusion here, but yeah, the the girl committed suicide. And yeah. And now this this I'm like, glad I mean, I'm glad I'm not a youth in this um, oh, generation. I had enough bullying in high school. Really? Yeah, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, without being bullied online as well. But, um, and this is the whole problem, is the fact of it wasn't even the girl that did it, it was the mother who did all this bullshit and you're going, at what point does the drama have to stop? And the problem is, that's mm. the problem with the internet is that it's a great conveyor of information, but it's also a great conveyor of drama. Mm-hmm. And when that drama, this is the problem, again, going back to the mm-hmm. fake eagle or something, it's all this drama which is the problem, where it's like Early on this year, the, one of the Fazdown cosplay is called the Tardis Dresses. Mm-hmm. Oh, and the one, that's the most, that. one of the most mm-hmm. infamous ones is this um, girl. I keep saying girl. I always feel weird about that. Yeah, I do that too. But um, this uh, lady. Woman, lady, female. Lady, lady's good. She's, <laughs> see, I wouldn't call her fat. She's mm. overweight, but she, I thought she was gorgeous. But she is overweight. <laughs> and she's wearing, this, she's wearing this you know, big dress, mm. gorgeous dress. Yeah, and she has the... Um, Especially, it was the first one, mm. at least the first public one, where she opened up yep. the uh, front and it turned into the Tardis yep. console. So I saw a picture that was very beautiful. She looked fabulous. She looked, mm. she looked like she just stepped out of a bloody ballroom. Mm-hmm. She was gorgeous, and of course, everything was just like her. I bet it's bigger on the inside to cover up the fat count. All this other mm. really negative stuff. I mean, I'll admit privately, I'm there going, yeah, bigger on the inside because it's a Tardis. It's yeah. like a gag, but that joke would have to be made. It's a joke, it's a yeah. joke, but then when it's just like, oh, bigger on the inside because he's a fat cow. It's like. Oh, yeah. yeah, and then it got worse from there. It mm. just got denigrated, down, down, down. and she basically she stood up to it and she went, "No, I'm proud of this, mm-hmm. and I'm fully behind her." Mm. I must admit, I would have made that joke, but at the same time, I've also grown up a lot. Mm-hmm. So, 
I still have that amphibian part of my oh, brain yeah. that would make a joke. Oh, but, my, and you know, I'll think mean things about people the way think, they dress occasionally. We all think mean things. It's just whether we say them out loud. Yeah, There's a difference we'll between. Them. It's the difference between saying them out loud, which separates you know the civilized people mm. from the um, you know knuckle dragging mm. Neanderthals <laughs> of the internet. Mm. I do think that the five foot rule should apply to the internet, but that's beside the point. <laughs> I think, but, um, though, to defend somebody, um, the defense of somebody like that sort of reminds me of, um, I don't know how to say it. Um, okay, just say you say, oh, I hate it how women are always judged on the way they look. Oh, don't worry, you're pretty. The point is women are being judged. Whether she be fat and ugly, it's the point that really mean things are being said. Yeah. Um, oh, the she, fact that uh, she actually is attractive doesn't make that better no, no. or worse. Uh, just, a, just putting it out there. She's attractive to mm. me. I say, I think I found her very attractive because I mm. thought she looked fantastic. It doesn't matter. The fact she should, she defended herself is I think, more of a cool. point to mm. because I didn't exactly... I am posted on Facebook and said, mm. look, check this out. She's she's fantastic. Mm. It's a great dress. Yeah. Appreciating was, beauty is fantastic and fine. Yeah, but the fact that people were just like going, oh, she's a, she's a fat person mm. in a costume. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be a mean bastard. Mm. There's um, a few places on the internet where fat hate is actually getting to me a little bit, mm. um, being an overweight person myself. <laughs> um, the attitude and fat hate towards that is um, really quite intense, and especially when they talk about it in terms of health, because it's really no one's business. <laughs> well, there are... <laughs> what somebody's health uh, is to going, say. If you're going to health, and of course, mm. yes, um, overweight... Mm. Um, I'm not denying has it's been, not ...has been linked to certain things. Oh, absolutely. But, that being said, there's certain physical ailments that are going to happen to skinny people, yeah. and there are fat people who live mm. very long and healthy lives. Mm. So it, that to alone... judge to judge someone and say it, you're judging them on their health, something so personal that just yeah. I've got no word, but that's just yucky. Yeah, it's creepy. Mm, yeah, I think it's funny because the internet started off as formless. You know, people mm. made their avatars in mm. the sense of you know there was no Facebook where you know people go to forums they mm -hmm. they chose the pictures they wanted to represent themselves mm. and let's face it most overweight people would choose a slim person <laughs> or men would impersonate females. That leads to the whole gag of the <laughs> internet which is there are no women on mm. the internet, they're all men. Which of course is empirically false mm. but <laughs> well, often people do assume you're a guy. It's a very male dominated language mm. on the internet and let's face it, that's because fifteen years ago mm. the majority of people on the internet were men. Not necessarily they weren't female, but mm. female female yeah. people. The men people and the female people. <laughs> no. Um it was it's a male dominated voice. Oh now the transgenders are gonna be upset we're leaving them out. <laughs> so we've but, got to be use language that's inclusive of everybody. But the thing is modern day internet is a lot more open, you know. Internet activism, while debatable on how effective it is, we wouldn't have the gay rights movement we have now if it wasn't for the gay advocates using the internet to promote their yeah, view and sure saying, gay, gay we're, just like, we're, just, we're just normal people, guys. We're not, we're not babies. We're not mm. atheists. I think, um, yeah, the gay rights movement had a fair bit of push before the internet as well. No, but their message is a lot more widespread. Mm. You look at, say, for example, George Takei. He's mm. probably one of the most widely known people on the internet. Mm -hmm. He's like got billions of Twitter mm -hmm. followers. Everyone's on the links to him on Facebook. Whenever he posts something, it gets spread like crazy wildfire. You know, and mm -hmm. he's well known for his stance yep. on gay marriage and stuff. He's well, he's married to mm -hmm. his lifelong partner. You imagine that ten years ago? Mm. No, everyone was just like, "Oh, he's a fag. Let's mm. show him away." Oh, there's more acceptance towards homosexuals, mm. transgendered, and bisexual, intersex, and all sorts of people now. Yeah, people and the can, be can who they want. encourage that. Yeah. But it can discourage it as well. There can be. I mean, faggot is such a common term to use on the internet. The funny thing is, I think of that term. I was actually saying this to someone else the other day. I think of that term in the sense I don't. I don't use the term at all. Mm. It's like it's like it's the, lazy. It's like the N word. Mm. No, I'm going to say it. It's like nigger. <laughs> I don't use that word, and when I use it, I use it to make a point. Yep. I don't like those words. I don't use them. But when I think of fag, I always think of South Park, where <laughs> they redefine fag not to mean gay, but to mean an annoyed and obnoxious person. Mm. I think so. cigarette when I think fag. <laughs> like I was, I was talking about this to our, our friend, our mutual friend mm. Maddie. I was saying when I grew up, uh, spastic wasn't a negative word for mm. me because I grew up with there was a society called the Spastic, the spastic society. society. Yeah, yeah, which 
do it, positive, really great things. And it's a term for, to describe specificity of the muscles, which is yeah. a symptom of some disabilities. I am socially aware now mm-hmm. that I shouldn't use that term mm. for the most part because of the negative connotations. Mm. It's like I would never use. I would go, we're just this is just degrading into the worst words in the entire world. But, <laughs> and there's other words I wouldn't use, but like that's that kind of mentality. And that's I think that's the same problem with like fake giggle mm. and all that type of stuff. It's like we're using these terms. And ignore it, kind of it even ignores a lot of the, the problems with them. Like I said, I hate the term neck bearded basement dweller because the funny thing is, let's say, say the stereotype used to be true. Mm. I'm not even saying it was true when it was, but it was the fact of the stereotype of a nerd, you know, as a guy who's doesn't necessarily overweight, but like mm. the neck beard thing's a modern day thing. I, I'm personally insulted by that because I don't shave often enough to, <laughs> to, and I have a beard. Yeah. Um, but there's this whole idea that. Every negative nerd is this guy who's, you know, <laughs> I wear a fedora. I love my fedora. I've been wearing it for years. And this whole idea now is like, oh, fedora wearing neck bearded um, basement dweller. Why it's not like, reclaim it? It's a good thing to be. But I don't, it's, not, it's nothing, there's nothing to reclaim. That's the problem. It's just like, it's such an, it's an invented, it's like fake geek girl. It's an invented, nasty term. Uh, like the um, TV made up, um, cashed up bogan yeah. that created a, a thing. Yeah, it's a, it's an invented word. I'm not going to mm. take back an invented mm. word that really is useless. Point. It's like, I can understand wanting to take back that N word because mm-hmm. it is a quite and it's quite a horrific thing and mm. it means a lot to a lot of people. Yeah. So taking that back is kind of a thing. Although I must say, I'm, I have more of a strong a reaction to negative words against Australian Aboriginals yeah. than the the term nigger, which I um, have a racist thought myself when I hear. I think, oh, do you have to sound like a yank? But I think that's the other <laughs> problem. Is, well, I grew up in Britain, so that word never had any impetus mm, for it me. Meant to never, me. Yeah, it's it, only it, an American thing. It's an American thing. We had black people there. Mm. No, in England, it was the darkies. Yeah. Which always sounds so... Whenever you hear it, it's always that thing of the Irish the dark <laughs> You know, you ex- you expect it to be like you know the person who said it's going to you know trot away and play polo in five mm-hmm. seconds. It's, it's always I think oh they're darkies. And I was like oh, I don't care at all <laughs> about that. I, I, I've always been one of those people like you be cool with me, I'll be cool with mm. you. I always had that mentality. The funny thing is I got picked on a lot by the darkies mm. in England uh, more so than the whiteies, but the whiteies still picked on <laughs> me anyway. I hate them all. I think it's important though to talk about this to about that how language is important mm. and how it creates how we think about things and how we see things and an idea comes about like a fake geek girl and that language yeah. means something. It's, I don't know that. Yeah. that no, no, don't yeah. know where I'm going with that but you know the strength of things like racial slurs um, terms like whore attention whore that's why I have a problem with that. Um, I think for me the whole fake geek girl because it's, it's something that's a part of my culture and I think mm. it's a part of my culture I, I, I love geek culture and I fully, mm. I fully embrace geek culture. You might have noticed. I did notice that yes. Um, <laughs> And I think it's one of those things where you see it and you're just going, this can't be allowed to keep mm. going. I just don't because... think it actually exists. I think one or two people made up this concept of a fake geek girl and everyone lost no, their th- collective shit. The problem is, it is, it's not, I won't say it's an, a widespread thing, mm-hmm. but it exists in mm-hmm. the sense of... Girls do get more victimised, more asked, yeah. more questioned. The fake geek, Are you really a geek? Talking about fake geek girl is a way to express these other problems that I see within it. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, I can't be the authority on this. Yeah. Why? I'm a guy. Mm. I can certainly cheerlead it, and I want to talk to... That's the thing, I want to talk to people about these issues, mm. because I think it's... For me, fandom has been about culture without borders. Mm. You look at fandom, you go... Fandom has never been at that point where you all liked the same thing. You mm. all had to like Star Trek to join in. You all had to... You know, it's that thing of like, they are back to the checklist. Mm. Okay, you've seen Star Trek... Click. Mm. Uh, you've seen Star Wars. Click. You've seen Battlestar. Click. Mm. You've read every single Tolkien book. Click. <laughs> okay, you've got <laughs> enough geek points to join the club. Mm. I think there's still a, there's, there does seem to be within any group a bit of elitism, like we're saying with what you like, liking at first. The term the term that I I now use is the term that I believe Will Wheaton and John Scalzi have coined. It's called the gatekeeper. I use the term self-appointed gatekeeper Mm -hmm. because it's the people who turn around and say, you're not allowed to join in because you -hmm. you haven't studied as much as I have. You don't have as much passion as Mm -hmm. I have for this. It's like, how can you judge that? It's stupid. But what about exclusion of um, people within the scene? Here's the problem when when I talk about, I'm always for inclusion. Mm -hmm. Uh, My stance is include them all. If they don't want to be part of that, they'll go away. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) 
Or there is such a thing as social evolution. Mm -hmm. What means that if there is an undesirable in a social element, it has a tendency to sort itself out in that, say, for example, there's a group of friends. One of them is just very obnoxious. And after a while, people just go, I am so sick of that Mm -hmm. obnoxious person. Doesn't necessarily have to mean he's being deliberately cruel because if he's usually being deliberately cruel, someone might just get out of here. People are gen... Seldom so deliberately cruel. It's mainly stupid. Well, that's it. When they're being so obnoxious, they might get to the point where they stop being, in, you know, people stop inviting them to something, mm-hmm. and then people stop inviting them, and the people stop inviting them, and naturally they wean it out. Mm. That happens regardless of anything. So just include first, you're saying. I'd rather err on the on the side of inclusion. Mm-hmm. I'd rather say let everyone join in. Mm-hmm. If they're fake, they will be found out in five yeah. seconds. And guess what? If they are fake, you have the opportunity to make them learn. <laughs> Yep. Right. And also fake could just mean different things. Like you could call someone fake because they haven't read all the books you have. That's just being elitist. Well, okay. Let's just think about me. Because why not? <laughs> it's <I've>, your podcast. <laughs> I've read practically... I won't say I've read every single Discworld novel because I think there's one that's just come out which I haven't read oh, yet. Oh, okay. To a, to a hardcore Pratchett fan, I'm no longer a nerd. Mm. Because I haven't read that last mm. book. Where I'm there going, dude, I've got like a lot of stuff on my plate. I can't really sit down and watch everything. Five years ago, mm. I would have dropped everything to read mm. that book. I can't do that now. There's been another Pratchett non-Discworld book, uh, Nation. I still haven't read that. That's about five. That's about four or five years oh. old now. Does that make me any less of a yeah. I don't, I don't nerd? know if, um, yeah. It's so hard to pinpoint what exists, like what of this exclusion is actually happening, how it's playing out. That's, that's my point. How can you, how can you have a barometer to say, mm. you've got to reach this level to be in our club? Mm. If it was, if it was an actual club. <laughs> then you might be able to have that, yeah. Yeah, that's a club with rules and regulations. What we're dealing with is a society. Mm. And while, well, not even society, a culture. The culture, mm. society is even different to a culture mm. because Society has it's rules made up and regulations. Lots of them. Society has rules and regulations, mm. most of them implicit, most of them explicit. But a culture usually doesn't have those rules. I think they do. They're just but they're implicit. Are, and... Implicit. It's like, for example, the implicit rule with being a nerdy geek culture is you like something nerdy. That's the <laughs> that's rule. just the one. You just have to like. Yep. That is the rule. You like something nerdy. I like something nerdy. We can have a dialogue mm. from there. Or better still, you like something nerdy. I don't like something nerdy. That's a dialogue. Mm. We can talk about that. I'm not going to turn around and say, oh, you love Battlestar Galactica? I hated Battlestar Galactica. You have to lead the club. Mm. It doesn't work like that. Exactly, yeah. But it's it's also to do with, yeah, as I said, where these things are playing out. Yeah. If you're at a... Because I was thinking a con, a convention, yeah. is very constructed. Yeah. It's often you're often... might be staying at a hotel. It's... You're in costume. Yeah. A lot of people are in costume. Um, they are deliberately made to be an inclusive environment yeah. where people are welcome. The problem is... It's, it's got... It's, it's got actual that. borders. It's in a convention centre yeah. or a hotel, so there's actual physical borders of it, and it's for a set amount of time. Yeah. If that's where you're living out this, they, I guess there's like, if there, there might be, um, some of the ones have alcohol available, so there's heightened emotional states. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's usually, that's usually a place like Dragon Con where it tends to become a five day party from what I've heard. Nice. <laughs> um, but and how different this is from, you know, how you might go about your everyday life. I think there is a, a push now, more so than it was, not even five years ago. The, the geek culture is a lot more mainstream now than it mm. was, yeah, five years ago. And I can and see why that bothers in crowders. I can see why that bothers in crowders. And okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pin one particular thing on being one of the biggest. I won't say problems, but being one of the biggest reasons why we've mm-hmm. got a huge mainstream nerd culture now is Big Bang Theory. For clarification, mm. I don't like the show. I. I have a I, weakness, and it's called American sitcoms. <coughs> I have a natural revulsion. It's called natural uh, American towards sitcoms. American sitcoms. <laughs> you probably hate all the things I love about them too. I've tried watching it. Don't get me wrong. I've tried watching it. I just find the characters are very no. I, I, I'm not even sure if they've got enough dimension to be one dimensional. Mm. I find they really pander heavily to stereotypes. Yeah, it's a sitcom, and it's, mm. it's one of those things where I don't like it. Again, I'm I'm a huge Will Wheaton fan, and he mm. loves the show. So, like, that's sometimes a, that's I a, actually get annoyed at the characters. That's a, that's a difference of opinion by one of my geek idols. I'm mm. wearing a Will Wheaton yeah. shirt as we speak, but I don't like the show. Mm. But I think that show has had a dramatic impact on how geek society has been shown. I think a lot of it's fairly positive too. It's portrayed positive, but I think it's. As I said, I think a lot of those one dimensionalities has mm. kind of reinforced a lot of those negative stuff. A lot of the other as well. Like you, that's what they do. Like that you type have, of person. you have the creeper. You have the creepy guy mm. who's always kind of being le- then again, creepy guy lecturous to women. <laughs> you have got the guy who can't talk to women. Who's mm. like, you know, women turns up. He's like, 
Mm. And then you've got the hyper anal, you know, know it all. Mm. And so you've got these tropes. And, and then the normal guy. Well, of course, the, for normal, normal is normal's worth within the geek culture. Mm-hmm. And if anything, probably more people are more like Leonard. Yeah, the yeah. normal guy. The the, the mm-hmm. normal nerd. He's, he's still, the one you're supposed to be able to relate he's to. He's still the geeky kind of guy. But mm-hmm. I'd say the majority of the population, actually, the, probably the majority of the population are more like the bloody um, Penny mm-hmm. than they are of the, of those four. Because most nerds are very normal. Yeah, we just like nerdy shit. And also, the funny thing is. You have as much to say about stereotypes, mm. the Big Bang Theory. Let's let's also face it, they're all attractive young male guys. For unattractive men, they are very attractive men, I must say. No, but that's the American thing. It's though. Hollywood unattractive. It's Hollywood unattractive. <laughs> you you gussy them up, they are going to be they're going to be on yeah. the next bloody mm. um catwalk. Thing. Of course, it's like the girl who's unattractive until she takes off her glasses and Ug- done, of course. Ugly Betty. <laughs> Ugly Betty, they couldn't, they didn't hire an ugly person to play Ugly mm. Betty. The girl they played to hire Ugly Betty was actually quite Scorgeous, attractive. Yeah. She's really pretty. Oh, we throw a poncho on her. Uh, and she's nerd, ugly. No <laughs> glasses and braces, and she's ugly. Yeah, again, it's like yeah, sitcom be- uh, ugliness. Mm. Just wait for them to. Not another team movie has got the perfect yeah, example. Yeah, it of that. does. That's good. She takes thing. the headband off and the glasses, and all of a sudden she's perfect. Mm. It's like that happens though. It's so that, trans- that's real. It's so <laughs> transparent though. And again, but again, go back to Big Bang Theory. You don't have the the, the neck bearded, overweight no. guy in that cast as well. So even within that mm. constructive reality of like, oh, look at the nerds. You also don't have that other stereotype. <laughs> but yeah. at the same time, there's a lot of people that look like that. Mm. So it does my head in sometimes because I'm like, and the Big Bang Theory could be it's a it's a good bridge of the gap, but I don't like it, mm. <laughs> and that's I think what people get really pissed off at. That's why I say five years ago, Big Bang Theory is about yeah about five years yeah. old. So and thought, it, yeah, and yeah, but it's um I feel I think it's you know it's a it's a great way of getting that bridging that gap. Yeah, it has a has in that way, and, some, and it's popularized a lot of things, which yeah. is which is cool because. But I can see that elitist thing that they don't want what they're into to be popular. They want it to be this honestly in um, crowd a, thing. Honestly, a few years ago when Big Bang Theory came out, I thought that way in the sense of I was worried that the Big Bang Theory was going to be the thing where all of a sudden something that I deeply adored is going to become the next fad. Mm. Not necessarily it's going to become popular. I thought it was going to become a fad. The next fad, yeah. And that that worried me because mm. I thought this isn't a fad for me. This mm. is yeah. This is, this this is, is what I love. This, this is, is who a, I am. If anything, I might even say this is a lifestyle. Mm. This is something I deeply adore. Something I deeply love. I don't want it to see it ridiculed. I don't mm. want it to see it denigrated. And I don't care about it becoming popular. I just don't want it to see it become this cliche. Uh, yeah, it's highly commercialized cliche. Mm. But at the same time, I think it's fantastic that you got a Flash T-shirt yeah. in a major <laughs> store because. But that, the problem is, of course, not many people are going to see it as a Flash. They're mm. going to see it. Oh, it's Sheldon. Yeah, when I was into band shirts and stuff um, when I was younger, especially when I was into heavy metal. <laughs> I um yeah was quite strict on the rules of what t-shirts you were allowed to wear. How many times throughout school did you see kids wearing heavy metal t-shirts who had never listened to the band? Um, not sure because I was very strict on them. Unless it's your boyfriend's t-shirt, then it's okay. But just say saying, though, the amount of times where you see band shirts and it's just like in you know, a mega death and Metallica, and it's just like no one heard that music. They just liked it because I don't know. I always found they L A. Perfect, better, better, better example. The L A. Raiders baseball caps. So they were fan oh, okay, back, yeah, that's that. Where so it was like it had a Viking that looked badass. And it's like, oh, okay, what what's all that about? And like, oh, yeah, what sport is that even? <laughs> it's NFL national football. Um, good eye. <laughs> well, football for the American listeners. <laughs> I always actually found that an, an excellent end to talking to blokes. That's actually something I wanted to say. Yeah, go on. Girls get a lot of um, reward for certain non-gendered activities. Yeah. Non-gender typical activities, such as liking video games. Yeah. Not one of my likes, but I've had similar gendered rewards for liking metal when I did oh. and liking horror, so which I, I just, still do. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's the other thing, horror. You know, you think about how many girls love horror, and it's like... I shouldn't love horror. It seems scary. like a girl thing to like to me though, because I'm a girl and I've always liked it. No, but you always and get those people. I got it's from like, my mum. You got, you got these people. It's like, oh, girls shouldn't like this because it's all screaming mm. inside. No, that's half the fun. Sometimes you idiot. No. Well, yeah, my dad said my mum used to you oh, know, get him to take her to the horror movies, and yeah. he would be very chivalrous to put his arm around her when she was afraid. <laughs> I know, but then I know guys who won't watch horror movies because mm. it scares them. So it's like I, horror movies are horror movies; yeah. they're all fun. It's it's all again like most movies are make believe. People, I think people re- realize how unreal movies mm. are not, nowadays more than ever. So yeah. Ever. But no, the thing I was going to get back to those Elevator Caps in high school. I I was a huge fan of the Late Show. 
the D generation later. Yeah, I used to watch that in high school. Well, one of their failed, to quote, I think it was Tony Mark, their failed uh, uh, merchandising attempts was they would wear these um, baseball caps. With oh, I always white... wanted one. I had one. I bought one because I was so happy to mm. get this. And I used to wear it all the time, especially at, uh, at school. Mm. I had this one guy, typical... LA Raiders shirt. He goes, Oh, what the hell is that? I said, It's my, you know, it's a light show, it's a show I love. I said, Oh, LA. I said, I turned around and said, I tell you what, you tell me one player <laughs> from the team of your club, and I can name you every single cast member of the late show. Didn't really have an answer for that. Oh, that sounds like a nice win. But it's like, you haven't got my shirt. At least mm. I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, have a got my bloody baseball cap. I think it's a great way to open conversation, though. Like, if you like something that someone likes, and you know, they're wearing the t-shirt, and you can yeah. say, "Oh, I like your t-shirt." Yeah, that's that's half of that's, that's half of the conversation. Yeah. You, you know, I, I was I was at a um a burlesque thing the other night. I was Ooh. I was playing on my phone, which I've got. A, of course, you would at a burlesque thing. I was very I was dead tired. I was waiting, <laughs> I was waiting for my friends who were performers to come back and. The, the crowd had dispersed. I was dead. I was practically <laughs> dead to the world. So, I, and I was checking my messages on my phone. And I've got a, um, as you can, I'm pointing towards the microphone. Because um, <laughs> it can see. Oh, that's uh, really cool. It's a leather book cover for my phone. So, you know, if I leave it like that, it looks like a yeah. little mini encyclopedia, even with a little bookmark. And this guy came up to me and goes, I love your phone cover. I was like, so, what? I, was like, I got one too. I was like, hey! <laughs> nice. So, that's a shared knowledge. Mm. So I totally agree with that, the whole idea. That's why, yeah, band teachers are a great idea mm. because you're getting the name of the band out there. You and uh, yeah, mm. if someone goes, I love that band. You, you've got a mm. conversation. What's your favorite song? Oh, this one. Oh, mine's this. Mm. Or oh, that shit. Try this one. It's on the, it's on the earlier yeah. album. That's a conversation, and I think that's what geek culture is all. That's, yeah, absolutely. That's what I think geek culture is mostly about. It's usually that shared mm. knowledge because you don't go into a geek culture going, I don't know anything. Mm. Or if you do, you go. I, I want to know. And it's a great way, you, you know, getting, meeting people is a great way to learn more about the culture yeah. because often there's no other way because it can be quite a solo thing to get into by yourself. It, it usually is in many ways. You don't, you might watch, say, like, mm. Red, I, I watch Red Dwarf My Folks mm. and I think I kind of, I wouldn't say introduce them, but yeah. I probably was more of an impetus on them to go to conventions and oh, dress up. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> than the, than other, the other way, way around. around. yeah. Because I was always dressing up. The concert, and so it's you know that thing of I've kind of gone the other way with that, but I probably wouldn't be nerdy if it weren't mm. for them because I did grow up on nerdy kind of I pursuits. Probably wouldn't be who I was without well my um, brother's geekiness, um, my sister, yeah. and my mom totally made me a film buff. Absolutely loved horror, oh. and that's where I get it from. And she didn't let me watch a lot of movies because she was afraid I've had sex in, <laughs> but if had horror, that was fine. Oh. <laughs> But that's a that's a complete different discussion altogether. Mm. Ho- um, violence versus nudity mm. and sex in in media, and that does my head in sometimes. To go back to a previous point, though, I was yeah. saying that um about like a gendered reward. Yeah. Like if you're into video games and you're a girl, that's yeah. somehow better and special. If you're into horror, as a you know, do guys get equal praise if they're into knitting? I think I that's... don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, in on the one hand, it's that thing where it's to be expected. Mm. Uh, a guy should like horror. A guy should mm. like guns. A guy should like blowing yeah. stuff up. I'm a costumer. I'm doing a lot of things where I've been learning techniques on how to do things. You probably so. so. That, well, that's it. I was just going to get to that. If I turn around and said, you know, to a bunch of burly men, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just, I've got to go home and knit. <laughs> It's, they prob- it's perfectly they probably thought you were still, probably think you're speaking some sort of code and not to want to be left out of the loop. They'll be like, oh no. yeah, I like totally knit all the time. No, they'll probably think, oh, he's going to go knit. No, he's going to go take it up the ass. But <laughs> Okay. That escalated he quickly. <laughs> if he's knitting, he must be a pork. Of course, yeah, you must um, be. I wrote about this in my blog um, a few months ago when I was making a plushy Miss Smarty Pants for my big mm-hmm. Macintosh costume, which is a My Little Pony yep, the toy. For, yep. for the listeners out there. Uh, listeners. And so I made the plush toy by myself and I had to learn how to do a hidden stitch mm-hmm. didn't even think about it I just said you know oh, yeah, I am just doing this to do a hidden stitch and my mum because I was describing how I was making the scarf I was like mm-hmm. I'm going to pull this over and then I'm going to do a hidden stitch on the end so it, and she just goes I never would have thought I would have heard my son say that word <laughs> and it, it was that thing I'm like going oh my god it does sound like you mm. know oh my god he's he's just come out the closet and I was like no, that's not even what I was even thinking about. It's just, I'm trying to build Again, a costume. Again, and that's sexism towards... No, it's but... sexism because it's saying gendered roles should be a certain way, but or you're different, or you're gay, or... I don't think she meant it like that. No, of course My, my brain... She's meant, having a joke. It, 
she was having a joke. It was mm. clearly all in jest. And it made me laugh like crazy because I just was like, no, that wasn't... Oh, my God, that's so... Yeah, that's mm. very funny. And I didn't take it as, like, a thing of negative. Like, oh, mm-hmm. she was thinking, okay, I just actually think that was actually quite funny. And I did realise at that point, I was like, the stuff that I've been doing this last year with all the... You know, because you get people who build costumes like, oh yeah, I build a costume, I get the hot glue gun, mm. I, it's like, no, I still sew. Mm. You know, I'm trying to learn how to sew, I'm trying to learn how to stitch properly so my clothes don't fall apart. And, but the things that I've been doing for all this costuming, I realised, mm. typical gender roles, it's like, oh, it's very girly and womanly with things I'm doing. Yeah. So I don't think about it that way. No, like, of course not. And anything, it isn't. I apply my uh, my mentality, my habits, and my training, whatever you want to call it, or my experience from industrial arts. It's the same applied knowledge, just with a different fabric. I think of a sewing, absolutely. Yeah. I think of a sewing machine like a bandsaw. Yeah, it's, know, it's a tool. Yeah. It's a tool. I'm making. I'm sure it's a very manly sewing machine. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice and print. No, so it's not even. I don't even think about it like mm. that thing of a gender role. It's just that thing of mm. I'm building something, and that's. Mm. It never even occurred to me until my mum made that comment, and it wasn't. I said, I don't no, know, she, she, she would have. She, yeah, she a, knows you. She was having as a well. gag. She was having a gag at, pretty much at my expense, but it did snap that thing. I'm like, oh my god, you know. That I is never, true. <laughs> you know, that's kind of true that I'm, I'm learning these things, but I, it's not an issue for me. Mm. I'm also autodidactic. If I want to learn something, I'll go and learn it. Mm. I'm very much self-taught on a lot of my things. If I can't find where I need to learn, I'll ask someone else. I'm insanely curious. Which is why my last bout at university, honest, to be perfectly honest, mm. I didn't care about getting a degree. I just wanted to learn. And I think that's kind of what screwed me up because half the time it's just like, yes, I'm learning all this stuff. Oh, now you got to write an essay. Mm. Ugh! I, I love writing essays. I it's hate fun. writing essays. I always get stuck. I guess that's what I mean when I say I'm a geek. <laughs> Well, that last conversation where we were talking about all this, um, I had to officially declare you a geek. <laughs> I know. I, I didn't like, used to think... I, I sometimes think my my likes are really, really esoteric. <laughs> that's the thing. All I like, like a little bit of everything. Yes, and, a, and quite a few of those things very, are. very, very rare that you'll get... Mm someone who is I like Star Trek and mm. nothing else or and I like yeah. Star Wars and nothing else I collect but there's always this a, only yeah. thing there's, there's going to be a favourite though there is always going to be favourites not even favourite yeah favourites but most geeks love everything mm. like for example there's so many sci-fi authors out mm. there you'd go insane if you had to try and read them all just to catch up yeah you can't do it like you know I've read Isaac Asimov but I've never read Carl mm. Sagan I hope to. I want to someday. But you know, I know some people go, you've not read Carl Sagan. You're, you don't know what you're talking about. It's like, oh, you haven't read Larry mm. Niven. Yeah, I want to one day. I just haven't got around to it. I have come across sort of um, really elitist, especially intellectually elitist people. Funny- but also a lot of get are really like inclusive or really um, understanding of people at different levels. Or yeah. if I'm, I mean, I, I've told geeks that I started to read The Hobbit quite a few years ago and just found it too challenging. And they're like, oh, yes, it could be hard to get used to. I saw the movie and I quite liked that but um i actually got into the lord of the rings movie because i'm a huge peter jackson fan <laughs> i i remember that um sitting in the cinemas for fellowship of the ring and in the big screen mm. when Windup films came on i had a fangasm yeah because <laughs> as much as like yeah talking mm. i was like oh my god it's yeah this is peter jackson's mm. thing and you, you think, Wingnut Films, that's his mm. production company yep. since, well, Bad Taste. Yeah. So every, any Peter Jackson fan knows that mm. title. And just seeing that, it, it's not even framed in like his usual Peter Jackson, mm. you know, comedic way. It's all deadly serious. It's on the big wide screen, the mm. Megasin Stadium. And you're just there going, holy shit. <laughs> if you'd have watched Meet the Feet, or Bad Taste, mm. I saw Meet the Feet before I saw Bad Taste. Yeah, so did I, I think. So, Bad Taste released second over here because of all the band and all that Okay, stuff. yeah, I think I heard that. I know someone's probably going to be screaming at the, the, the microphone going, no, you're completely wrong. I've, I've revoked my geek card. I think I've revoked my geek card probably five times in every podcast. Either way, but just seeing that there, you're just going, I think of it, the feels. I think of Bad Taste. Mm. I think of um, yep. Brain Dead. And I think of, oh my God, this guy who made all these cheesy horror films and here he is making this epic Lord yeah, of the Rings. Absolutely. That's when it kind of truly hit me in the gut. But you also see like how his stuff has moved on from oh, yeah. like, like Heavenly Creatures and the Frighteners, which had yeah, much I, higher production I, values. I still haven't seen Heavenly Creatures. Heavenly Creatures is fucking amazing. I've, I've been mean to. I just never got a copy of it. Fucking amazing. Have you seen um, Forgotten Silver? No, I haven't even heard That's, of it. Uh, Forgotten Silver is a mockumentary about this forgotten 
New Zealand filmmaker from like the um, turn and it's not real. It's completely not real, but it's yeah. framed to be real. Because I sat through all of This Is Spinal Tap thinking it was real. Oh, I love This Is Spinal Tap. It's one of my favorite <laughs> movies, but I also love the music as well. And that one we went to, Rock and Roll Nerd. Yeah, I sat through half of that thinking it was fake. No, and that was real. <laughs> waiting for it to get funny. <laughs> no, I love rock. I love Rock and Roll Nerd as well. <laughs> and hasn't Tim Minchin gone insanely popular since mm. then? He's amazing. You, th- you think what five years ago we watched that? Mm. And, that was ages ago. Yeah. Well, it was released in the cinemas about 2008. And I go, jeez. So I don't, I'm not really watched any Tim Minchin. I don't listen to I went to see him um, with the orchestra. It was yeah, I went amazing. to see that. But the funny thing is, all my Tim Minchin comes from Rock and Roll Nerds. So mm. all the fun stuff from that, and a few bits and pieces I've seen online. So all my all my headspace about mm. Tim Minchin just comes from this mm. one documentary. So I think about Tim Minchin just as more the person than the mm. entertainer. But you, think of, you see where he's coming that time. For someone who, in that movie, was desperately trying to gain a break. And it was just that literal one last ditch mm. effort. He changed his image and tried to do this all this stuff. And it's just gone, the gangbusters for him. And Damn, that was good. Oh, anyway, yeah, so Forgotten Silver is this whole idea is that it's about this forgotten filmmaker in New Zealand, and they played up all the stuff that he actually recorded, all this historical stuff that only just been discovered that proved, for example, video footage of the first manned air flight before the Wright brothers, like about mm. three months before the Wright brothers did their first one. So it was all fake. <laughs> But they never said they oh, it was nice. fake. They deliberately um, did it. You know, they released it onto the TV mm. and everything as a real thing. It got to the point where people were calling for the history books to be rewritten oh, for this wow. person to you know be acknowledged as the first uh, person to yeah. And, also that, and I think they came out with a, with a press statement. You know, after the show had aired to say, no, it's all fake. We <laughs> faked the entire lot. And people still believed it. Nice. I'll try and get a copy of it. It's probably on YouTube. But it's so good. Speaking of docos, have you watched King of Kong? No. I think you should. I think I should, but... <laughs> because it's, yeah, very cool. Shows the two guys. Um, well, it, it focuses on the one guy trying to get the, the Donkey Kong highest score. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you might be telling me mm. that. I've got a, I've got I think you'd really like it. Yeah. Um, Although the Pac-Man one's quite interesting. Um, but I won't go into that because it's probably not interesting to you. <laughs> well, Pac-Man was probably the first game I got as a handheld game oh, wow. in the 80s when that was, like, the coolest toy you could have. Oh, yeah, when the hell, when handheld uh, games came out, it was like, oh my god, it's like a computer, but you don't have to carry any TV. And yeah. the Game Boy came out and changed all that. They had also, like, Game & Watch and all that stuff. Those things are insanely um, collectible, mm. the Game & Watch series. Well, the game I've got up there with, you know, mechanical moving parts in it is the oldest game I've got, and that's from about 79 or 80. Oh, wow. Yeah, I used to have these, um... This, like, one of them was, like, a racing game, and it was, like, mm. a the Space Invaders-type game, and, yeah. yeah we had a fun, Space Invaders... Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong 2, and Treasure Island, which had three screens. That was pretty fancy. <laughs> those, the funny thing is, working condition of those ones, they are actually insanely collectible now. Mm. People pay a lot of money for them. I think a lot of it has to do with nostalgia value. Mm. Getting back to the whole geek thing, this, I think that's a lot of things. This, this nostalgia value is now becoming a huge thing. Yeah, that's just that's a fashion at the moment, the 80s nostalgia. Yeah. And I think to be an age where I can remember the period they're being nostalgic about, I, I, you I, feel differently about it. I think this. I think it's starting to encroach into nineties nostalgia mm, again now. It's God, like they're reprinting like Nirvana shirts and <laughs> such. You're like, oh my God, yeah, there's kids today that are wearing Nirvana shirts that were probably conceived <laughs> to some of these songs. <laughs> <laughs> just... And like, yeah, when they're remaking a lot of movies, especially horror. Oh, no, I'm like remaking generation. Robocop and that sort of I know this is actually a very huge tangent, but this is going back to something a long time ago. The funny thing is, the whole um, thing about cosplayers, oh, they're doing mm. it to be sexy. You look at the industry, all the images of females, well, mm. I won't say all because... Most. That's predominantly, just... all, 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 predominantly. The, all the her- heroines, yep. all the heroines in the comic book industries from the 1940s, mm-hmm. Till today, or nineteen thirty, whatever you want to call mm. the start, are all very sexy. They're all yep. very voluptuous. They're all mm-hmm. very shapely. They're all if they're and not, scantily clad. If they're not, if they're not damsels in distress, they're femme fatales. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. The funny thing is, this is where it gets incredibly stupefying when it comes to the mm. female costumes because they get accused of being overly sexual when mm. they do costumes. But the thing is, they do an accurate representation yeah. of the industry, and it's like. Oh, you're just looking like a slut. It's like, no, I'm dressing up like a power girl. She's got a hole in mm. her chest area, which shows her boobs. Mm. And actually, the story behind that is the original creator of um, Power Girl. Likes boobs. 
Well, actually, yes. <laughs> that's the point. He drew this character, but she was pretty much ignored. Mm, so course. he decided to have a bit of fun. He decided, if those of you interested, his name is Wally Wood, and he actually ended up drawing porno comics on the side as well, including Ooh. there's a very infamous image where it's like this Disney orgy. That was actually done I'll by... I'll be Googling it later. Either way, he knew that was the lack of editorial control over this character. So while she started out kind of, well, average for a superhero, mm. opponent, but decided as he was comics would continue on, every issue, he draw her breasts bigger <laughs> and bigger and bigger until finally someone told him to stop. <laughs> this is all the story and allegedly no one did. <laughs> so now it's this thing where Power Girl is kind of known for mm. having very ample assets <laughs> and especially because she's got the boob window but she's also you look at her compared to most other female characters most artists draw a very muscular mm-hmm. as well so she's always very kind of big nowadays mm. and so it really works you know the whole gets to hold her she's a big mm. woman and she's still very feminine and very sexy so yeah all the power girl costumers yeah why are they going to do it? They've got to have a boob window. Why? Else it's not authentic. And then she's fake. I was going to ask about, like, you know, the strictness on authenticity with, like, the elitism we're talking about. I mean, would it be a common thing if somebody's costume at a con wasn't very accurate or was a close approximation? Would people come up to you and tell you, perhaps, that, you know, your costume failed? Because I think that's pretty rude. There would be people who would do that. Yes, we're going mm. to de- try to deny that. But for the most part, they just wait for internet comments. Okay. But no, the good thing about the, especially the costume community, for the most part, people like it when they change things up. For example, Mm. um, I don't know how much you know about the whole steampunk. Yeah. People love steampunk. There's a lot of people now that always take characters from my things. And and steampunk steampunk them. them. Oh, very clever. A lot of Captain America cosplayers now, they'll do showgirl Like, uh, if you ever watched the Captain America First Avenger movie, when he's on stage and there's all these showgirls in the costumes, they will do that costume. But we'll, they'll still have the shield and wear the, ca- the mm. helmets and stuff like that. So they'll they'll combine these kind of, mm-hmm. like, elements together. And, like, they'll, they'll be, like, all female adventures, but they'll be all in dresses. Ah. And, and there's a lot of great tinkering that goes mm-hmm. into the costume. There's always going to be the purists who go, I want to have it exactly mm. like that. There's always going to be the ones that just I've got $20 and I want a costume I'm building because I can I could think that would make people feel quite excluded or maybe even not even welcome to go if they feel maybe if if they want to dress up as a character say but they don't want to wear a wig or dye their hair and they don't want people you know walking up to them telling them oh your hair's the wrong colour people will do that they're idiots yeah I do know that that they're idiots and I don't think that's the majority you're talking to a guy who has made one of the most accurate four Bushman costumes Mm -hmm. on the planet and it's a character that nobody knows about (laughs) and I do why do I do it because it makes me happy yeah and that's why anyone's going to cosplay because it makes them happy but yeah. I would feel discouraged from doing it if I felt that if I was to go to a con people would make comments and tell me I wasn't right or they wouldn't tell me I'm a fake geek because I'm overweight so I couldn't possibly be accused of that but um, yeah that's what scares me about going costumers to costumers have to have a thick well let's just face it costumers do have to have a thick skin to do this type of mm. stuff because there's always going to be disparaging remarks personally mm. I tend to avoid a lot of that online stuff Someone probably made a comment about my mm. fat ass on online somewhere. I don't particularly care. Mm. As long as I don't see it, I don't particularly care. Yeah. Else. But I've walked through cons and I've had, you know, people say, oh, fucking fat. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Again, five foot rule. Mm. They will say shit there if they're not five foot away. Because most of the time, if people are going to make a fake comment like that, they're going to be doing it away from you, but like within earshot because they're talking to their buddy. Mm. Um, I think there's also a difference between, say, someone, you know, on the way to the con seeing you in costume, making a comment, haha, look at that person in costume, than someone in that insane telling you, you're not good enough saying you know your hair's the wrong colour or your costume's most, not good enough most people for the most part are very positive that's the thing with the, mm. with the I would think so yeah most people for the most part are very insanely cool they, mm. well they're just not they're normal people like, they wouldn't walk up to someone and insult them but it does yeah. happen and yeah. as you've said some really mean and horrible things are... yeah. we as a species will say mm. we'll, we'll think horrible things mm. we'll think great <laughs> things we'll think you know we'll think the most disgusting you know mm. loathsome stuff about it you know say for example mm. there's a sexy female cosplayer your brain will probably there going <laughs> You don't exactly go up to the girl and go, hey, I want to have sex with you. That's something you just don't do. Because... Could work. <laughs> but no, it, that's the thing. It, mm. It's That's probably what, why. That's what being the creep is this whole mm. thing. Going back to the original topic. Now, ultimately, it's, there's, a, there's a sense of decorum. And if you saw a girl in a... Not even, like, say, a skimpy bikini, but, like, someone who had a nice dress and a girl walked down a nice dress, you don't go up and say, hey, I want to have sex with you. Yeah, they do sometimes. Some they used to do, yeah. But you can think... It. Or, you know, make make a comment about your body or... Yeah, you can... Th- it's, like I say... I Positive say, or negative. It's it's fine to think mm. these things. We all do. Yeah. But it's a different... It's the mm-hmm. connection between the brain mm-hmm. and the mouth. And the mouth, yep. 
that. That's not you. It's um, me. Also, uh, what he was saying before about the sexy characters, I was actually thinking about. I think um, dressing up and embodying like really sexy characters is a really good way to subvert any sexism. But I that... mean, if it's in a sexist community and people are making these horrible comments and accusations, but putting that aside for a minute, I think that's a great thing to do with an idea that could be considered sexist, like a damseled character, like Princess Peach and dressing up as Princess Peach and giving that character movement and voice and life but and showing. What... How much cost- you love that co- but that's the thing. person. That's what that's amazing. a lot of costumers do. That's, that, you've hit it right on the head. A girl dressing up as Wonder Woman is not dressing up as Wonder Woman because, oh, she's a sexy character and mm-hmm. I like being sexy. It's like, no, I usually dress up as Wonder Woman because she's a character that embodies mm-hmm. strength. Yep, she really She is literally character. one of the most powerful people mm-hmm. in the DC universe. I think at one stage she was the second most powerful, mm. technically just under Superman. Mm. That's been changed around a lot, but either way. And uh, Wonder Woman's a character that you don't... I can imagine a lot of girls would like the aesthetic of Wonder Woman without really knowing a lot of mythology and oh. canon. Or what do you but call the stuff? The story? Wonder Woman has had a presence outside of a comic book for, mm. for decades. Yeah, you absolutely. Look the, you look at the Linda Carter a TV series mm-hmm. and that's still even known today yeah it's like that was one of the most popular shows of its time and to say that oh, oh you don't know the 50 oh, sorry 60 years of comic book <laughs> history therefore mm. you're not a nerd is absurd I think it's a little bit fun though like we keep saying this about oh you have to know this you have to know that it is fun to know it and it's fun to show off if you know it and it is fun to talk about how much you know and how much you've read it's, it's when it gets nasty that it's the problem but again that's what I'm saying about communication you know you talk to another comic book nerd and say oh did you read this comic book no I haven't read this one yet you should read this one it's very good oh yeah good. exactly just having this recently when I was saying we're talking about Harry the Duck I'm like oh, you, you read this issue I really enjoy it it's like no I didn't particularly care for it well read this one instead mm-hmm. yeah, that kind of thing we're not Harry the Duck fanatics we're not even Harry the Duck there was a movie of Harry the Duck wasn't yeah, there yeah this is why that really about. scared me somehow <laughs> when I was little and saw it it bothered me deeply I should should I watch it again or is it not? I haven't seen it since I was a kid so I'm not going to recommend it lots of weird shit but bothered like, me when I was a kid we're not Howard the Duck aficionados mm-hmm. we're not going to disparage anyone because they don't have our shared knowledge of Howard the Duck mm. why because I don't oh there's probably one freak out there that's hey I'm a freak too mm. so. there's probably one guy out there who's like you know read every single Howard the Duck and knows everything about Howard the Duck and collects mm. the Howard the Duck collector's plate and they've got the DVD edition but, you know, it's not like you can say, I'm not a nerd because I don't know what Howard the Duck is. Um, it does, though, to get the term title nerd or geek, or even to use the word fandom, there does seem to be parameters over what kind of hobbies these are. Well... And what it includes. You say that. What is a jock if not the sports nerd? Yeah, exactly. A modern-day nerd or a geek? Because, again, I, I like to use the terms interchangeably, but I know there's people that go, I don't like the term nerd, or I don't like the term geek, or... I don't like either of them. I'm this. And it's like, whatever you want to mm. call yourself, it's interchangeable. It's all about passion. It's all mm. about it showing that love. That's um, yep. Simon Pegg. He's got a great mm. comment about that. I've got it written down somewhere because it's a great thing to say. Yeah, I've read the Simon Pegg quote, and it's um about... Um, but they are probably... The so not having to hide like, absolute yeah. enthusiasm for stuff. Yeah, it's right. not having to hide mm. it. And Hank Green talked about that as well, how yeah. you can go to Harry Potter with this jump up and down. It's Harry Potter! Excitement. Well, it's like you know, they just recently announced that um, J.K. Rollins is going to be writing mm. a new movie, exclusive, no book, just a movie mm. for this thing. And, and it's um, still in the same universe, isn't it? Yeah, it's like a, I think it's like set 50 years or so mm. before um, I heard, Harry Potter. I heard the first one was about the guy who wrote the book that Hagrid used, but you yeah. had to pat the spine. You get people going, oh my god, we're going to get a new Harry Potter. And then the other mm. people going, but it's not going to be Harry Potter. Mm, yeah. It's like, <laughs> you're getting more stories from your, this universe you love. Okay, I think we've had enough of the prequels thanks to George Lucas, <laughs> but I think it's safe to assume that this is mm. going to be a, 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 a mm. worthy watch. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing how strict people can be with law. Yeah. Um, sparkling vampires. Not acceptable. <laughs> and I, I agree. I, um, think spark- quite I think sparkling vampires, it's a good trope because it just shows you how bad that idea it can be. Uh, I've not. I've tried to read Twilight. I really have. <laughs> I got ten pages in and I rage quit. I could not handle it. And that was me being objective. Mm. I breathed in. I relaxed. I said, I'm going to like this. I'm going to like this. I'm going to... I know. I did not like it at all. I could not get into it. I, I read them. For uh, me, they it were was, just nothings. For me, it was the fact that you spent nine pages of this girl whining her face off about moving to this town she mm. hated and then on the 10th page it's revealed that it was her decision I went nope not reading any more of that I'm s- I've had 
no pages of sticking through it and then just went, nah, you've lost me. Yeah, she's she's terrible. <laughs> she's a terrible character. So I've not watched the movies and I I know people who have and they're like, mm. I wish I had time back. <laughs> That's why I like, I like the gags around Sparkly mm. Vampires. I think the only thing I have an issue with the Twilight fandom is that <laughs> It's like the Beep fandom. It's so overly aggressive when it's like, you know, it's the best thing ever. It's just like, no, it really isn't. We can put you... To on- be young. We can put you onto good things. We can put you onto good music. Mm. We can, you know... Do you believe they- in gateway reading? In the way they have gateway drugs? Um, <sighs> that reading stuff will lead to reading <laughs> maybe more intense stuff? I like think- you start with something like, like Twilight and you um, I think- move up. <laughs> I don't know, because I think reading... If reading stimulates your brain in that way, you're going to want more stimulation. Mm. It's like probably anything, really. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a gateway, but it's like... For example, if Twilight stimulates your brain Mm. to get you to read more Twilight, that's fantastic. I know Mm. Harry Potter does. I don't Mm. know about Twilight, but I know Harry Potter got kids reading. Even when I didn't... Never read Harry Potter, Mm. never watched the movies, and I wasn't exactly... It wasn't my demographic at the time. I was just like, Harry Mm. Potter, not interested. I fully supported Harry Potter because it got kids reading. And I think that it's a fantastic thing to do because mm. if a kid can read Harry Potter, they might move on to The Hobbit. They might move on to Tolkien. To- to- hopefully, they'll stop. Well, before, uh, hopefully, yeah. they'll stop before the Sibilarian. <laughs> I um, as I do believe in gateway reading. I heard it on a um, one of those television discussion shows where someone suggested that someone might start with something like Twilight and it'll open them to reading more. And the host rather snobbily said, "Oh, I don't believe in gateway reading." Uh, no, I think if it's if it's a if it's something that helps stimulate, mm. then it's a good thing. It can never, never be a bad thing to get people reading. Why? Because I think a literate population yeah. is a is Absolutely. a more educated population. I mean, I didn't have any interest in. Oh, I had no interest in science in high school. Why? Well, kind of got beaten out of mm-hmm. by by high school science, which sucked. Mm. But in this last few years, I've been reading. Uh, I've been like, reading a lot of skeptical things. I've been reading um, all sorts of different articles. I've read an entire book of Isaac Asimov's. Um, um, scientific essays. This is cool. not. This is his nonfiction, and I found that invigorating. I love that so much because it, it, not necessarily it's the science that's interesting. Mm. It's also how he presents it. I've read a couple of his um, essays, um, mm. just general essays about science fiction in anthologies, and he's mm. really funny. He's one of... laugh out loud, <sighs> and he's just sweet and just comes across. I like that. As a most one of those those guys, I wish people would. Uh, I would I would have read more books in high school mm. if I got to read things like Asimov, not the utter tripe oh, okay. that we had to read in, at in throughout my school. If year. I didn't like it, I just didn't read it. <laughs> yeah, but you got penalised to not. Yeah, read you book, did, so. <laughs> but that didn't that didn't really bother me at school. I wasn't um, the best student. <laughs> but my later high school years, I started reading by myself, and what got me into reading Pratchett. Because mm. the first Pratchett I tried to read, I think, was um, Man at Arms, which I just. Mm-hmm. Did not, I could not get into because I read about five pages and just like... Yeah, I had, yeah. The same. I had the same with Pratchett. I couldn't get into it for a while. I borrowed The Carpet People off mm-hmm. my friend, which is literally Pratchett's first book. Mm-hmm. And it's a very simple book and it got me into it. And yep. then after that, I started reading Colour of Magic and it just goes like, Ugh. Those early books are a bit mm-hmm. of a grind to get through. It's very hard. But I read Mort. Mm-hmm. And I, Mort yep, still, Mort got me started too. Mort to this day is still one of my favourite books. I, yep. I always proudly proclaim I have a copy of my mm. car and I always have a copy of my car nice. why if I'm sitting alone and waiting for someone in the car mm-hmm. I just literally reach behind my mm-hmm. back pocket pull out the book flip it open to mm. any point in that book and I can start reading and I'm yep. immediately hooked into it I know what's going Absolutely. on I've read it that many times and I still love the book yeah, I've read it a couple of times like, but so much approach at stuff like this Stuff that I've read in a Patrick book that will make me laugh to this day. Yeah, I'll think about it. It'll just pop in my head. I also now because I'm a film, I've done filmmaking stuff. So I think about the cinematography of the thing, and it'd be a hard movie to do, but mm. it'd be fantastic. But how yeah. would you show Death's Place? That's the thing. How would you show Death's Domain? The whole idea, this whole thing that's everything that's made entirely out of mm. black. There's ways to do it nowadays with like digital effects and stuff mm. like that. But you know, the whole idea that the the mountains are forever on the mount on the periphery and all that other stuff, and the, yeah. the ponds that don't move, and all this kind of interesting gear. Mm. And so, the yeah. images are still invigorating, mm. and Pratchett. and the humor and the book mm. itself is just great. The whole description mm. of Mort being made entirely out of elbows and knees, you know. <laughs> yeah, you can see that perfectly. That's at the beginning, but then when you get to the end, 
this is why you need a great actor for this because mm. at the beginning he's supposed to be awkward and bumpy mm. and all that but at the end of that book he is like you know straight up smart he's very proper you know his, his progression throughout the book is still very good I think that's also one of those books when you're a gangly teen that's probably the best book to read <laughs> it's like as people also say Ender's Game it's yeah. like when they read it as a teenager when they go through that awkward puberty mm. especially when they're trying to discover who they are and mm. I've heard a lot of this is why the whole Orson Scott card hate mm. thing has been I'll get into that tick apparently he's quite mean uh, the reason why a lot of people loved Ender's Game because a lot of the book was about accepting who you are mm. and all that sort of stuff hurt a lot of people who were gay teens mm. who have read that book and it helped them wow. get through it so when Orson Scott Card came out against um, homosexuality which let's face it is part of his Mormon mm. upbringing it's kind of what he believes you can't yeah you can't really do much about that. So when he starts spewing all the stuff about uh, anti-homosexuality, mm. there's a lot of people who loved Ender's Game just went, mm. how could you do that? Well, you can like someone's work or you can like someone's art if you don't like them. Actually, the funny thing is, some of the best sci-fi writers... Death of the author, perhaps. You know, it doesn't the, matter. Some of the best sci-fi fiction I've ever read has been from Mormon writers. Mm -hmm. So you go, sci-fi, Mormon. Although isn't Stephanie Meyer a Mormon? No, oh, no idea. Oh, Again, read five... Read ten, literally ten pages before I quit. She's a hack. I know that. Person. Yeah, I read Ender's Game. I've got a few, a few images from that. Like lasted with me for ages. The one that always um, comes to mind is the whole thing of yeah, he's always he was the kid that was shunned aside because mm. like oh you don't know what you're doing, chef aside, mm. and the thing where he's like kept alone and like he then decides to try and triumph on his own, on his mm. own, and the bit where oh I'm trying to remember, it's been a while. Because they're wearing the suits and they've got the gun, guns that like stun parts of the body, so they get hit, yep. they get stunned. Yeah, when they're in that so zero he, gravity. Yeah, in the zero gravity. Yeah. Thing. And it's the bit where you know he he puts his legs up, mm -hmm. stuns them in front of him, jets yes. off towards them, and gets the that goal. That was cool. And it's like this whole thing of everyone, every single time they tried to shoot him, all they were shooting was his already stunned <laughs> legs. So yep. it was acting as a shield, mm -hmm. which made him plow through and mm -hmm. get to the goal. And it was just like. Ah, that was brilliant. That's that's an imagery that's mm. stuck in my mind, and it probably will be stuck in my mind to the end of time because it's just one of those things where you go, that's that character you want to be. You mm. want to be that smart, that innovative. You know, the whole bullying thing, and yeah, when he's getting bullied, you kind of, as a kid who's been bullied, mm. you kind of relate to that. You don't exactly relate to the whole thing of him going absolutely bug, bug nutty and killing mm. someone. Yeah. When that gets revealed at the end of the book, you're like, going, yeah. he doesn't know this. You're like, oh, mm. crap. For me, the books that, like, um, as a teenager were more your um, Judy Blooms and... Yeah. Um, oh, I've, I've read one, I think it was Sweet Valley High, I had yeah. to, and I was just no, like... Yeah. 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 Judy Blooms um, a much better writer than the, the Sweet Valley High. I I was into some pretty trashy yeah. books, but Judy Blooms a pretty good writer, and um, <laughs> Kathy Letty's, I think I read it a bit later, but Puberty Blues is amazing for that. <laughs> I had to read a... Which is, like, like this, I think it's the staple of um, high school English education, is Lucky Leonard. Yes. I could not stand I never read that one. No. Actually, I get that confused with one I read recently for an ethics class called um, Jasper Jones. Yeah, it's definitely not the same it's one. It's you know, mm. but... Because this is all cool. about, like, you know, a, a boy teenager in Australia mm. growing up and... Mm. Yeah, I'm not a surfer. I'm yeah. not relating to this at all. <laughs> I've read a couple of books set in Australia which I've really liked for that familiar sense. Mm. You know, like, a, a character was sitting um, at Geno's in Frio, and I liked that. Setting has always been, dare I say it, it's never been relevant to me. Mm. I've read a lot of the the Janet Ivanovich, Stephanie Plum series, uh, the yep. One for the Money, mm -hmm. and all that set around Jersey. Mm -hmm. And someone who knows nothing about Jersey. Oh, yeah, of course. And all that stuff. So it's always Jersey-centric mm. stuff, and it's always that. But if you were from Jersey, when you read them, you'd go a little bit yay. Yeah, I know, but the stories were still completely mm, really good. And even though there's, like the old, oh, there's a bit of like the ethnic stuff in there, where mm. it's like, you know, pan, I don't want to say pandering, but the whole, like, if you know about it, you'd probably get a laugh. It was general enough that it was so good. I think that's also why, to a certain degree, I think sci-fi and fantasy do appeal to a mm. lot of nerds. Because yes, for the placement. You don't have to know where you are, and sometimes escape isn't mm. is exactly about that sometimes you want to escape back into the past mm. past history with dragons or mm. you want to go into the future with spaceships yeah a completely different universe is yeah. definitely the appeal of lots yeah, of sci-fi fantasy you know, it's also aspirations mm. I personally am a sci-fi guy I'd rather go forward than go back <laughs> but the only the games you get mm. nowadays that are based in modern day that are big bazillions of money things like Grand Theft Auto mm. and what that it's escapism mm. fiction where you go around stealing cars and shooting cops and hookers and, mm. you know it's it's kind of lowest common denominator but 
I'd rather play Mass Effect 3, yeah. you know, where I'm travelling the galaxy trying to save the Earth from the impending <laughs> doom from all the giant robots mm. that are trying to kill everyone. You know, I'd rather play that than go around beating up a, yeah. beating up on people. Actually, I was I was thinking that with, um, thinking of uh, the latest GTA game, with, um, if I had boys, or girls, but boys that wanted to play that, I'd be like, oh, I would be happier if they were blowing up aliens. <laughs> um, and more make-believe. <laughs> Type areas of violence. <laughs> I think kids, have, it's been shown that kids kind of know the difference for the most mm. part. Oh, it's not that they don't know the difference. I just think also, you know, if there's a eight-year-old kid going, I want to play Grand Theft Auto 5, I'd be like, ha 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 ha, no. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, at eight, probably I'd say no to him. I'm sorry, it's, a, this, it's a sliding yeah. scale, but I, I've been playing video games since I was, mm. I think it's in on the previous podcast, I've been playing them since at least 1983. Mm. I, can, I know I've been playing it since 1984 because of Ghostbusters. And we I had, remember playing Ghostbusters. Yeah, we had, this <laughs> I still love that game to this day. So a lot of those games weren't mm. Grand Theft Auto, but I, I was, well, because I was gaming when Grand Theft Auto came out. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure if I said it on the podcast or not, but um, I had a friend of mine in high school, and this was literally the year before Grand Theft Auto came out. Mm. He pitched me this game idea where it's like, oh, this is a game where you go around, you break into you, know, you break into cars, and you drive around, and, mm. and I said, that is the most stupidest idea for a game ever. No one's ever going to play that. Next year, Grand Theft Auto comes out. Oh my god. <laughs> That's like the same as my brother invented Sims. Like, just before that came out, he was saying, wouldn't it be really good if you could have a game where you were like, just go get a bag of chips and build a house and just be a person? Like, that's so dumb. <laughs> And then uh, Sims that's, got really popular. That's, that's why the idiom, you know, no one, there's no such thing as a new idea. You know, people, yeah. By the time you've had a new idea, five people already had it. Yeah. Um, At the same time, in very, yeah. you know, yeah. all over the world. That's why you also technically you can't copyright or trademark an idea. You can only trademark. Not until a, you make it into something. But that's that's a completely mm. different uh, subject. I think the ratings on games are good with the violence, though. Well, we finally got an R rating mm. system. Um, but really, it I but think that was the, a good idea. No, it, it's it a, wasn't. It's a very good idea. It's an incredibly good idea. But but like everything, they implemented it completely. R of course they did. So they now have an R rating system, but they still censor the R rated games just in case kids can get it. What's the point? Mm -hmm. <sighs> Again, it's that thing of kidifying everything mm -hmm. for the sake that just in case. As an adult, I don't want Dora the Explorer in my mm -hmm. video game. I, <laughs> you know, I don't want the Cabbage Patch Kids video game to play. I want to play something with mm. a bit of grit. If I choose to play Dora the Explorer, that's my decision. That's fine too. I'm not saying that you should, but that's... Like you'd like something made for little girls. I've, Come I've, on. I've, <laughs> I've played uh, quite a lot of the My Little Pony uh, app for the Android until I swap my phone and I can't play it anymore because oh. I have to start from the beginning. I'm like, oh, that's, screw that. <laughs> a game's a game. A good game is a good game, but at the same time when you're going, you, we're, we're not letting you have that choice. Mm -hmm. I'm completely anti-censorship. You might have yeah. gathered that. This is why I say it. I can't mm -hmm. be. I can't be the right. <laughs> and I can't be left because I think they're a pack of dickheads. Um... <laughs> I am firmly anti-censorship. I do believe in self-censorship, though. Mm, of course. I believe you sh you can temper your own thing. If you don't want to say something, you, mm. that's fine. That's cool. That's, you don't have to be outed about all the time. But I believe that no one should, no no government at least, should mm. be able to tell you what to do. This mainly becomes from um, old mm -hmm. research on it. Every single time a censorship law is coming mm -hmm. to pass, every single time, they always say, oh, we're doing it to get rid of the porn, or we're doing it to get mm. rid of the violence. And what they usually do is they use those laws to get rid of subversives. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's the slippery slope. That's what you've got to be worried about. They get rid they've gotten rid of literature. They get mm. rid of art. They use the same laws to get rid of things they don't like. Mm. And that bugs me. Absolutely. But the last time, back in, was it 1996? The US government was trying to put an internet block on, uh, put mm. a, a, a censorship block on the internet, and the Supreme Court quashed it. Part of that proposal was actually going to be um, banning online literature. And one of the things wow. that were, one of the things that were going to ban outright was um, the story of O. Mm, I've got that here. Which is <laughs> doesn't surprise. Um, which the funny thing is, yes, it's absurd. It's out outrageously um, pornographic. Mm. Uh, probably nothing compared to like, the internet <laughs> nowadays, but that's also considered to be literature now. Mm. That's also a book that's even been taught at like you know in literature classes mm. because it is an example of literature, a great example of literature, and especially and also it's a dialogue on ideas of, like sexism. And, mm. and, but under this legislation, no, nope, that would have been gone yeah. because it's pornographic. Yeah, and it's also pornographic in words; it's not even pictures. Mm. I don't. I don't think banning things is the way to go. I was talking... I was talking it's about, not banning, it's yeah, censoring. Censoring things. I don't think that's the way to go. We're talking before about um, you know, sexism yeah. and how 
we'll get there these eventually. forces um, aren't just one monolithic thing like beating down. It's like capitalism. Yeah. It's not one force beating down in one way. Yeah. It's all the other things and all the systems and how they all work. And media and information is part of that. Yeah. It's about those like perpetuating certain ideas. But banning things, censoring things, isn't isn't the way you deal with negative aspects of that. That's, I, I that's love... just not what you do. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what yeah. you do do. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I'm I'm of the I'm of the position that the only way to stop bad information is with more information. Not necessarily good information. Perfect. But with more information. That's more. That's actually really more what I was thinking. Stopping information doesn't mm-hmm. stop bad information. Mm-hmm. For example, like you know the whole idea of like racism. Mm-hmm. Banning, that's bad too. Banning, <laughs> it's, a, it's a horrible, <laughs> stupid, stupid thing. It's terribly. Mm. It's again lowest common denominator mm. stuff. But you don't ban racism by saying you can't be racist. But they do try in some places. With yeah, they do terrible try. results. But you don't do that by saying you can't. Mm. You can't ban racism. Like mm. you have to turn around and say no. This is why you got to point out and say if you want an example of why you should do it, mm. you can't get rid of it. You have to hold a light to it and say this is a bad example. Mm-hmm. Why is it a bad example? Blah, 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 Talking blah. about stuff as well is, yeah. a great, is a great way to combat yeah. any, any of the ideas that are bad and dangerous in society. Go back to the beginning of the podcast. This is why I want to talk about fake geek mm-hmm. girl stuff. I want to open up a dialogue and say, there's going to be people that very really disagree with mm-hmm. me on every single aspect of this. But then again, they're also going to be hiding behind a keyboard. <laughs> um, this is actually the point I've always wanted to bring up because while none of this is scripted, as you know now... <laughs> Didn't think it was. <clears throat> None of this is scripted. I've been practicing for weeks. <laughs> but I've, I, I have an idea of where I want to go. This is what some people don't realize about this whole geek girl stuff, fake geek girl, the sex of It's always that idea that it's a it's a female issue. I want to say feminist. The, the feminist. Are you not allowed idea. to say that on the internet? No. It... <laughs> No, the idea is that it's a woman's issue, so therefore it has to be a woman to combat mm, it. No, no, it's, no, no. it's, it's a, a people hu- issue. It's a people issue, exactly. The men also have to say, no, this is wrong too. Mm. You can't just say, oh, you, they have mm. to fight their own battles. It's not even about you know being chivalrous. It's not mm. even about being a knight in white armour. Because that's what, kind of sexist too, some people. <laughs> can't win with women or... You yeah, can't. Even, you can't even. Sometimes you can't even win being a good guy joke. on the. Uh, yeah, no, sometimes you can't be winning being a good guy on the internet because mm. you get called a troll. You get called mm. a, a white a white knight, and mm. yeah, some white knights are just idiots. And some are like, oh, if I be nice to the girl in the background, mm. maybe she'll have sex with me. I don't think that's quite as prevalent as my people mm. do expect, but there are idiots out there. No, this is the thing where I say I think it's a bad thing, and also I think it's a destructive mm. thing because if this is how we get represented. Mm. Absolutely. I must admit, a few times I've actually recently where I've I've read things or I hear mm. things, and I'm just going, I want out. I just mm. really want out of this out of this culture I've because heard. I'm just getting sick and tired of mm. all this really nasty, mm. bad stuff happening. You're just going. I didn't sign up for this. Yeah. I have heard of some pretty um, bad behaviours in gaming, online oh, gaming God. towards women, um, which is really upsetting. If you ever want to bloody get a pack of people turning into five-year-old boys, go on to bloody live chat on um, bloody Call of Duty. Mm. They turn into such arrogant little pricks. And that's why I don't do a lot of that type of yeah. stuff anyway. As, again, gaming's well, it's part, well, it's part of the subculture, I suppose. It's, mm. it's part of that fandom thing. Mm-hmm. A lot of the online gaming, it's... Oh, Gaming's incredibly widespread in the mainstream. <laughs> I'd say I'd say probably gaming has become more accepted before like mm. geek culture. I think a lot of that has to do with how yeah Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo mm. are trying to go. We want more people to come and play, mm. and so we try and open the barriers. And they try and police a lot of this negativity stuff. Mm. But when you got open chat, that's the thing. Um, studies have shown that uh, I hate using these terms because it's always. <laughs> It's what the weasels still use to prove mm. their points, but studies have shown that a lot of female gamers will go on these games, not tell anyone mm. what their gender is, and then not go on live chat. Because as soon as they open their mouth, be, yeah, they could be the best what game shit. on the entire server, and as mm. soon as they open their mouth, they'll be um, they'll get hated. And what's that serious? Like that's to me, that's kind of mind blowing that that shit goes on. Huh? I think it comes down to that stupid bullshit um, macho um, mm. machismo of like. I'm not going to get beaten by a woman. I, oh, course, I'm I much more happier oh to God, be beaten I by a... I didn't even think of that, of course. I much more prefer to be beaten by a man than a woman. It's like, oh, get over yourself. And I also know that not all gaming communities are like that, because um, oh, there's lots of MMOs that have like tons of women. Oh, yeah. Like uh, World of Warcraft, all the World of Warcraft, most of the World of Warcraft people I know are girls. 
I was going to say, I think I remember reading somewhere a while ago that the um, the majority of gamers on, not only MMOs, but I think definitely World of Warcraft, if you take off the um, the gold farmers. Mm-hmm. Who? Uh, gold farmers. Think of sweatshops in China dedicated I to people heard who... heard that. Yeah. We, we discount That's those... That's kind of sad. Ugh. Capitalism. Don't even, don't even get me to that. It's not even capitalism. It's just... Yeah, um, it's the system. <laughs> it's just people going, <laughs> we want to make money, so we're going to pay these people a dollar an hour mm. to just hoard gold mm. and uh, actually that's the first one of the first things I want to know about well yeah. how do you cheat and I found out that and I was like wow <laughs> yeah it's it's quite scary but I think of the actual legitimate players I think mm. it's predominantly now become mm. a more female mm. predominant mm. crowd I don't know what the statistics are but I think that's also because yeah. a lot of male gamers have probably moved on to different yeah. things and it's Oh, we're behind, are we? No, <laughs> Sorry, no, no, joking. No, 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 no. I don't even um, play. I think it's because WoW has that sense of community, which I mm. think is more endearing now to more players. And it's also quite... A lot of the games it's a very quite social, cooperative. It's a social thing. It's quite cooperative, a lot yeah. of the gameplay, from what I've heard. Which yeah, that's why you had the whole... Gender stereotypes. <laughs> no, even like, you know, the whole guild system and all mm. that type of thing. It really tries to generally encourage mm. cooperation oh, and yeah. sociable aspects of it. Whereas, like, I'm not really a... I won't say a sociable player. I'm not an MMO player. Mm. I, f- I get really bored by them, to be perfectly honest. Uh, very detailed. I'd, r- I'd rather go play a game like Mass Effect where I'm getting so deeply ingrained within that story and that world... Mm. Where I can literally spend a hundred hours and I'll be in pure bliss, rather cool. than spending a hundred hours killing five orcs again and again and again and again and again and again and again, and again because I've got to grind my levels up or I've got to um, you know accomplish the same same mm. tedious five missions fifteen times. I'd rather play something with a bit more in depth gameplay than an MMO. I, but I know that that's what people like. I mean, mm. if you'd have told me our, our friend Mandy, mm. if you'd have said to me five years ago she'd be spending all this time on a computer playing a video game, I'd, I'd be like. A, that person never in a million years oh, she's yeah. just told me the other day she's a guild leader now she's made mm. her own guild and that blows my mind yeah Someone she's who been was, playing for a while she's she kind of got into diablo 2 mm. years after the fact when i finally gave her a copy and um, i'll give i think i lent her my copy she finally got her own mm. yeah she's a she's a huge wow addict and she's it's not like she i want to say dominates her life she still mm. has an active social life but it's something that she does and she and her and her friends are doing it and I think that's fantastic it's nothing I want to do mm. and she doesn't exactly go you must play wow or get out of my social circle and people are like that let's yeah. be honest um, well sometimes that's all they talk about yeah I also do social ga- board gaming on like a weekly basis and I have I do have a, mm. kind of my group of friends that I kind of always play mm. with uh, but we always play all sorts of different games and we're playing we have, we're doing it for the fun of it we're not there to win half the time I mean geez, there was about a, a good what month or so where I didn't win a single damn mm. game and I wasn't going I don't want anything I'm, gonna, uh, the I'm, not, I'm just lucky if I can play I am um, I'm very much not into games and well, sports at all the first time I won a game in about a month I actually went what I won <laughs> I was I'm so more enthusiastic about mm. playing the game than I am about winning so mm. it's a non-issue for me whereas some people are so die in the wall have to win mm. It becomes... They can play me. They can win. I wouldn't be any challenge. <laughs> I, I do like challenge. I like playing. I think the play is the aspect of it mm. that I really enjoy. I would like to try a role play game one day. Um, yeah. I, I think I, that's something I could embrace because I get quite nervous. Actually... On the like, podcast, telling people I get quite nervous with, with games that I'm but, not going to be able to do them and that I The I funny thing is, going back to surviving high school, I think... Uh, yeah, well, probably necessarily... stems from high school. I started role-playing in high school, <laughs> but not fully full-time. And it was after high school I started playing more more full-time. And I, again, those, those are things that kind of maintain my sanity throughout some mm. parts of my life because it was a social event I could go with my friends and mm. we can spend several hours just you know not being yourself wow so that's sometimes that's just the best reading in the and world. movies <laughs> what yeah. I've always used for that especially yeah. movies but sometimes it's fun to act it out I mean mm. I can play a character in a role playing game that I've never been in a yeah. million years because that's actually what attracts me to role playing games because um, I've never mm. been into like acting or in, in just... any sort of theatre sense but playing like this from same... being a kid up until probably oh. way later than I'll admit playing make believe games I keep making lo- up stories I keep looking at the board games down in your shelves there I, I, don't... I know lots of kids no I was going to say you should see my friend's board game oh, you should see Eric's board game case it's I like, actually don't like it's almost as like tall as that really. full of mm. shelves of board games but they're all more indie games and they're all fantastic they're all so much fun no, there's a little bit of that it's there's, good fun when kids come over they, they want to play games but there's a little bit of I want to say acting but it's play acting mm. it's fun to get inside that headspace mm. you know and 
for example, there are people that would play role playing games. They're not violent. They're not say they're not violent. They're not, they're not, violent, they're not mm. necessarily malicious. They're not yeah. Evil. Oh. Yeah. And that they can play some of the most evilest of shit <laughs> you've ever played and you'll ever seen in your mm. entire life. And they just like getting in that headspace. And you would just be like, I want to hurt you so badly, <laughs> but I know it's a game, you know. Mm. But sometimes she's like, I, I fucking want to <laughs> kill you now. It's that, it's again. I think it's that mentality of you know you got to also learn to let go of that type of stuff very quickly. You mm. can't just go, oh, he killed my character, therefore I'm just going to be pissed off. At yeah, him. Like, yeah, I'm pissed off at them. I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've I've dealt with terrible role players. Mm. I've dealt with some great role players. I've dealt with some shit role players. And I, the only time I've ever quit a game is when I've stopped having fun. Mm. And that's usually I mean, you know, apart from when like you know I I start working nights and I can't do it. Yeah. And that's why I have the last one of the last groups. So it's just like, I can't do it because I've started working nights and it bummed me the hell out. But yeah, oh, and yeah, the whole thing of like, you know, this, the group peters out because, you know, life gets in the way. But so I've had some games where it's like, I really wish I could keep playing that game because I enjoyed it so much. I've always, like, you're talking about the groups and stuff playing, I've always described myself as, like, not a joiner. <laughs> Like, my teenage years were depicted by the fact I wasn't a joiner. Yeah. Don't do organised activities. Uh, I've been bowling in the last two years. The first time I've ever been bowling because I took my friend's kid and I was terrible at it. it again, if you'd asked me this time last year that I'd be part, not only part of a costuming group, but be part mm. of a committee making a costuming group, I would have said, ha ha, fat chance. Yeah, I've always been that thing of any 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 club that wants me as a member is mm-hmm. not you know is not worth joining kind of deal. I think that was was it Groucho Marx. I can't remember. I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm butchering the quote. I know, <laughs> but um, but here I am. I'm having a group. I'm doing a whole mm. lot of social things. Mm. It just happens. I don't mind social things. I don't know, but it, like, it's, I mean, like it's the games and sports side of it that. <laughs> yeah, but I think, like for example, with the sports. Yeah, I really not a joint. There's, <laughs> there's a competitiveness with sports yeah. which I don't find in gaming. Which I Fair think enough. I think that's why I like mm. I like games. I'm not a competitive person. Mm. I've never have been. I've always hated sports, especially because most of the people who play sports are just arrogant. Yeah, it's just very physical and tiring. <laughs> it's not even that because most of the people that play them are just ar- sweaty, arrogant, <laughs> arrogant pricks. I would have played more mm. sports if it wasn't for the fact that most of the people mm. I played with I just hated you know they're always the bullies they were always the ones that would push you into the dirt to get mm. their own advantage yeah. all that kind of stuff that puts me off more than anything mm. else I've played games with people who have also been like that and you also kind of just think I don't really want to play yeah. with this person why I'm losing my fun mm. because he's being too aggressive and again sometimes that social engineering happens you yep. try and move away from that person or sometimes you know that person might get a freaking clue mm. and just adjust their ways and just like yeah, okay maybe I'm being too aggressive maybe I should tone my stuff down if I lose I shouldn't be a Winching baby about it or something like that. Yeah, the yeah. competitive. I'm not a competitive person at all. Although I'm strangely competitive over things that aren't actually competitions, like presents. I just realised. I said on my solo one, I didn't want to listen to a gaming podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I might have to stop it there. It's been a while. <laughs> And it's been a very, very good chat. Yeah, I think we'll end it here. Thank you very much. Oh, thank for you. And, uh, that's a, that's been a really fun evening, yeah. actually. It's been yeah. friggin' awesome. I'm, I might cut this down to two. <laughs> <laughs> Because we're going a little bit off topic, then we came back. and yep. that, that is the nature of this mm-hmm. bloody podcast. But anyway, uh, thank you very mm. much for joining me, thank and uh, hopefully, I might see you again sometime in the future. Okay, bye, bye. Once again, I'd like to thank Tony Westerman for joining me on this podcast, and I look forward to talking to you again sometime in the future. Upcoming events on Saturday, October twenty-six, Cosmic Comics are having their Halloween anniversary celebrations. The Perth Ally customers will be there. I will be attending as well as Four Rushman. So please come along and say hello. Thank you very much for listening. I hope to catch you around. Bye. This podcast is copyright Simon Haynes 2013. The intro music is by Chris Miller. For more of Chris's work, please visit www.myspace.com slash here is Chris Miller. For more episodes, go to www.fanboycrossing.net. You can contact the podcast via Twitter on at Word with a Nerd or leave a message on our Facebook page www.facebook.com slash Word with a Nerd podcast. This podcast is released on the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 Unported License. For more information, please go to creativecommons.org.au.